And thank you everybody for joining this webinar on public sector enterprises. Um, this is a subject that is kind of forgotten in Pakistan. Public sector enterprises, but normally we forget, and especially the civil society doesn't seem to remember public sector enterprises. Or research because I do, I've hardly seen any papers on public sector enterprises. So when Istiqbal Mehdi Sahib ne janani ye suggest kiya, to I jumped at it because I thought it was a very good idea. Mehdi Sahib is obviously one of the veterans of this area. He knows this area very well. So he's the man who's put this webinar together, and I'll invite him to come first and lay down the um, outline and uh, tell us how to proceed. But uh, let me begin by just quickly introducing the panel that we have. Obviously, it's Takbal Mehdi. He's um, been uh, in public sector enterprises and many, many enterprises managed them. Set up, been in the board of investment, been in the board of management, and uh, set out a framework for managing these enterprises. So he's the right man to lead this webinar. And then we've got uh, many luminaries. We've got Arshad Zaman, former chief economist of. Um, of Pakistan, Dr. Shah Zaman. I'm very happy that Istiqbal Mehdi has been able to pull him out. I've tried my best and found it very difficult to pull him out. Then we've got Salim Raza, the former governor of the Central Bank, long international banking experience. He knows the public sector enterprises as well too, so that should be very good. Then of course, we've got Sikandar Khan, who is uh, uh, the main man behind Millet Tractors, uh, getting it privatized and uh, ran it for a long time, still the chairman of the board, I think. So he is uh, also very well positioned. Then we've got Tasneem Nurani, a well-known civil servant, uh, Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Interior, many places. Tasneem Nurani Saab has been, uh, um, you know, he's obviously very well-known, writes for newspapers, does many things, a very active judge. So this, I don't think you could get a better panel than this. So Istikbal Vedi Saab, since you are the architect of this, why don't you take charge and tell us how to proceed? Very, uh, uh, interesting uh, and um, uh, a great uh, panel we have uh, today. And um, probably, I think the first one person who will be um, uh, addressing um, uh, the, the, the webinar will be Ashadaman. Um, Ashadaman, um, it's just that uh, he will not be coming on the screen, but uh, we'll be hearing from him. And uh, so Dr. Aishad Zaman, and uh, then um, others you have already introduced, so I don't have to, uh, um, and they are already such well-known personalities, so you, we don't have to introduce any one of them anyway. So, um, so can we, uh, Nadim, can we invite um, Aishad Zaman to come in? Zaruji, go ahead, Aishad Thank you very Hello. much, uh, Nadim. <clears throat> Let Enough. me see if I can share my presentation. Please do. We can we can see this, uh, uh, but we can't hear you. You can't hear me anymore. We can hear you now. Oh, okay. I think I have to speak close to the thing. Yes. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Yeah. It is really a privilege mm -hmm. and a pleasure to speak to such a distinguished panel experts on state enterprises. In my talk, I will try to confine myself to making three points. First, that how states should manage SOEs is by now well known. But second, that the main difficulty is that both governments and our scholars lack the self-confidence to take charge of our own fate. This is a, a mental block of sorts. And so consequently, third point I would make would be that uh, we should, for the time being, forget about offering policy solutions that the governments lack the confidence to implement. And 
focus instead on building the capacity for thinking and analysis that is independent of inapplicable imported generic solutions. Um, this is what Nadeem was alluding to, I think, when he said, okay, can we can we make the the, the sound slightly higher? They, they, oh, I'll try to keep my mouth close to the I think that's computer. A good, that's a good idea. Is, is this better, Mehdi? Much better. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so now I my yeah, chin is more or less on the computer table now. So and I'll try to keep it that way. So without further ado, let me review what needs to be done. Hmm. Now it is said that generals are always fighting the last war. In the same way, governments are perennially trying to correct past mistakes. Meanwhile, the world is going through the fourth industrial revolution, and we are still debating whether the steel mill was a mistake or not, and other such matters. If we are to catch up and succeed, then we must stop looking back, look at where we stand and what lies ahead, and take risks and make decisions and take charge of our own lives. This seems obvious enough, but why have, haven't we been able to do this? To a large extent, I believe it is due to the widely held but mistaken belief that policy should be guided by ideology rather than pragmatism. This mental block needs to be overcome. Those who influence and make policy in Pakistan hold as a matter of religious faith three ideological positions that block pragmatic thought and action. This applies just as much to the research community as it does to governments. Number one, that the state has no role in the economy nor in economic enterprise. This is almost a dogma wherever you go. Number two, so the thing is to disinvest, privatize, and deregulate everything. And finally, number three, that the market, this uh, ghost in the machine, can provide everything. All that the government needs to do is to stand aside and let the private sector do business easily. Easily is code for meaning without oversight or regulation. Now, the origins of these dogmas have nothing to do with Pakistan. They arose in Europe, where fear of the Bolshevik revolution and the rise of Hitler led to a dis distrust of big government. Much of it owes to Hayek, who was a political philosopher, who as a teenager fought in the First World War, immigrated <coughs> to England, and was afraid that the Labour Party might bring socialism to Britain. Clearly, none of this is true in Pakistan. But we had to absorb these dogmas in the 1990s as a condition of borrowing from international financial institutions, most notably the fund and the bank. This has had a disastrous impact on the economy in Pakistan. As you can see from the graph, from 1989 to 2002, I call these years the long IMF 1990s. The long-run growth rate fell year after year after year for 14 years. In the first three years of the IMF 90s, the Planning Commission offered cogent reasons to the IMF why these pre their pres prescriptions won't work. But the IMF was in no mood to listen. Their position was my way or the highway. So in the end, the government had no option but to comply and exactly as anticipated, as anticipated disaster followed. In an interview published courtesy of Nadeem in the December issue of PIDE's Policy and Research, I have estimated the economic cost of this policy shift to Pakistan in terms of lost growth conservatively at around $75 billion. The good news, however, is that 30 years later, a few months ago, an official IMF publication has recanted from this gospel of neoliberalism. In the initial years, the Planning Commission had taken the position that the issue with the SOEs was managerial autonomy and performance monitoring, not the location of ownership. And it was intelligent regulation that was needed, not blanket deregulation. In the wake of the global financial crisis and the recent pandemic, the IMF has now come around to this view. It now holds 
that the that SOEs have an essential role and a gro and growing role to play in the economy. That privatization and deregulation of the kind that had been forced on Pakistan for 30 years should be avoided. And that the private sector cannot provide everything. And in fact, often has to be bailed out by government in the wake of crises. This, this would be hard to believe. Let us hear this from Paulo Mauro, the deputy director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF in an interview to Ben Hall, the Europe editor of Financial Times. SOE Paolo have been with us for many years. Why is the IMF focusing on this, on their role in the global economy right now? Indeed, hello, Ben. Uh, so uh, we decided to write the fiscal monitor chapter on state-owned enterprises because state-owned enterprises are important for people important for the macro economy and for the public finances. So for us, uh, writing a fiscal monitor chapter on this very important topic was a natural choice. Uh, what we have noticed is that over the past decade, state-owned enterprises have become more important in the global economy and they have become more international. So just to give you an example, we look at the 2,000 largest firms in the world uh, these are both private and state-owned, and what we observe is that today 20% of the assets of, of those are state-owned enterprises. A decade ago, state-owned enterprises represented only 10% uh, in that group of the largest firms. So today, uh, state-owned enterprises account for $45 trillion in assets in that group. Uh, this is a very important development in the global economy. Uh, moreover, they have become more international. There are now many multinational state-owned enterprises. Just to take the example of Europe, uh, there are 600 state-owned enterprises that are multinational and that are owned by uh, governments in Europe. In other words, <clears throat> while we were scaling back our state enterprises with, under IMF advice, SOEs were growing all over the world, including in Europe. So should we still privatize them all as we are being told by the IMF? Let us listen again to the fiscal affairs staff of the IMF. Coming to the question of privatization, we know that there are many different reasons why uh, countries have a certain portfolio of state-owned enterprises. Reasons can be political, they can be historical. Maybe many years ago there was a crisis and a private firm was taken over by the government. It became state-owned and then that never changed. So what we recommend to countries is that on a regular basis they take a look at the state-owned enterprises one by one and ask themselves, is the rationale for having this firm still in the public sector, is that rationale still valid? And there may be cases, for example, in small manufacturing where you look around and you see that private firms are already providing healthy competition in that market. So the rationale for having a state-owned enterprise in that type of market maybe is no longer there. Perhaps it was there a while back, but have changed. In that case, it makes sense to consider privatization, but there are some preconditions for privatization to be effective. One is to make sure that the integrity of the sale of the firm can be preserved. So we don't want to give opportunities for a corrupt sale. The other thing is that once you privatize, you may need an independent regulator to ensure that the privatized firm is balancing the uh, needs of the consumers, the firms, and of the government. So there are certain preconditions before concluding that privatization is the way to go. In simple words, the IMF has come around to our view that indiscriminate privatization is harmful. SOEs, they are now saying, should not be privatized until there are safeguards against corrupt sales, and there are arrangements to regulate privatized firms in the public interest, which we all know neither of these is true in Pakistan. 
So shall we leave it all to the private sector? Do state enterprises provide no essential services? Let us hear them again. As I mentioned earlier, they provide essential services in many countries. So water, electricity, these are essential services. And uh, if you think about the financial sector, some state-owned commercial banks or development banks have the ability to reach certain small and medium-sized enterprises, micro-enterprises, households, farmers, particularly in emerging markets that the private sector, financial sector doesn't always serve. So there's a role to play for state-owned enterprises right now. As you were saying, we've learned in past crises, including the global financial crisis, that during these big crises, private firms sometimes get into financial trouble and oftentimes the government decides to inject equity, take them over, particularly that's something that is sensible if there is a future after the crisis, these firms are viable after the crisis, but they do need the public intervention to keep them alive in the meantime. So we may well see that there will be an increase in the size of the state-owned enterprise sector during this crisis. Goya ki mere qatl ke baad usne jafa se tawba hai us zood pashema ka pashema hona Clearly, the solution to our problem lies in a close and continuous study of our own realities to cross the river, as the Chinese say, by feeling the stones. One difficulty, however, is that under the neoliberal framework of policy making, the government has stopped monitoring SOEs. The result is that the latest data available to government today is nearly four years old. Nevertheless, even a cursory look at the old data reveals that all SOEs don't make losses. Many SOEs, oil, gas, petroleum companies are highly profitable. And those that do make losses do so for very good specific reasons. The bulk of losses are confined to SOEs in two sectors, transportation and power distribution. Now, transportation can hardly be privatized, and losses in power distribution reflect the botched up breakup of WAPDA under the advice of the World Bank, badly and possibly corruptly negotiated contracts, and the failure to provide genuine independence to regulators. At the enterprise level, the main loss makers are the National Highway Authority, Pakistan Railways, and PIA. And after them, the four, uh, the, sorry, the eight discos that, uh, that are featured here in white. <clears throat> Interestingly, Pakistan steel mills, much in the news, ranked 10th among top loss-making SOEs. While the losses of Sindh engineering, which were 30% higher than those of steel mills, doesn't attract much attention. In short, the problem of SOEs are more complex than the often combative public discourse reflects. Of the 204 SOEs, only 11 enterprises, the three transport ones and the eight discos, account for over 80% of the losses. The rest suffer from problems of enterprise management, sector policies, and the burdens of miscoordination between social, political, and economic strategies and policies. Clearly, as I have said before, before there is really no substitute for a close study of each and every enterprise in any serious effort at better governance of SOEs. Since government has found this difficult, it is really up to civil society, and I endorse uh, Nadim's opening remarks here, to expedite the diffusion of the latest lessons of thinking and experience on SOEs, which at, arrive at IMF also five years later. 
within our community of scholars, concerned citizens, and the government. There is an urgent need, therefore, to create a network of experts, if not an institution, to provide governments, not only in Pakistan, but in the region, state enterprise boards, boards and managements and civil society with an alternative, evidence-based, locally appropriate framework for thought and action. I look forward to hearing and learning from the distinguished speakers who have been invited to this seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Asab. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting opening remarks. I think excellent, very well done. G. Next, shall we go to um, Salim Raza Saab? G. Salim Raza Saab. Sir, Salim Raza Saab, the mic enable nahi hai. So kindly, sir, next participant speaker ko enable nahi. Kender Khan Saab, would you like to go next? Ye toh ne badi clear baat bata di hai ki ji, it is a failure at many levels, as is most things in Pakistan. Most things are failures at many levels. So, batai, Kender Khan Saab. Well, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, my experience uh, that I'm going to share with you is with Miller Tractors, as you know, and. Uh, I have to go back in history a little bit to state uh, how it all happened, because I have the exposure to first private sector, public sector, and then again in the private sector. And uh, the history of Millet is that we, it was a privately owned company uh, by Rana Khudadad Khan in the middle 60s. And uh, it were, he bought this out from uh, a British company called James Findlay, who were importing tractors into Pakistan. So he took over this company and carried on this business in a, a small manner. They were producing maybe a thousand tractors a year for the next 10, 12 years, when uh, it got nationalized in 1972. I'm not going to speak too much about the time when uh, it was being managed by Rana Khudadad's family uh, because it was a very relatively small enterprise. It had a paid up capital of 25 million to 2.5 million rupees. Now it's a completely different story. Uh, so we got nationalized during the Bhutto regime and uh, a lot of companies were taken under the government's wing as state-owned enterprises and Milat was one of them. While we were nationalized, the government had uh, essentially given us two or three objectives which we were required to follow. I was a general manager here in one of the state enterprises and was transferred to Miller Tractors, perhaps in 1980 or 82. And uh, the objective was to try and localize as much as possible of the of the tractor parts so that the ancillary industry the small uh, and medium sized enterprise could develop in pakistan and that is what we were focusing on and at the same time try and uh, bring in farm mechanization in doing so uh, um, in miller tractors i think uh, it would be appropriate for me to mention uh, General Said Qadir's support to this company and that of Mr. Ahsanullah Khan, who was a bureaucrat and had come into the private sector in the public sector days. And he was uh, in charge of uh, Miller Tractors. And we started uh, the localization of uh, tractor parts. And we were asked to make 75% parts in the next five years. <clears throat> We did reasonably well. We were developed a new assembly plant with the capacity of 20,000, which was quite uh, more than uh, quite a large figure, bigger than what was being done in the country for tractorization. And I think it was a very important um, introduction into Pakistan because, being an agricultural country, we had to we had to mechanize, and this was the 
first step towards mechanization. So we started manufacturing and we started assembly and we had the support of our principals, which was Massey Ferguson, who supported us with the government's objective. And we were able to, we were able to uh, develop uh, 70, 75% parts in the next five, six years. But the important thing is that it was no longer a loss making company. It was making <coughs> phenomenal profits. It was very profitable in the public sector. And I think um, during this time in, in, our, in our experience in the public sector was very enlightening. I think we had the opportunity to send our boys abroad for training. We bought in technology. We bought in uh, um, a lot of uh, support from our principals, Massey Ferguson, and uh, we embarked on this road for localization in a very serious manner. And I think that has been one of the major reasons of the success of this company in the in the public sector. Mm. When we had and we had developed these parts, we became a very profitable company. And um, I think uh, government support helped us in doing all that. And um, we were under the control of the Ministry of Production, and uh, Ministry of Production was uh, was giving us a very good support in uh, trying to develop and to achieve our objectives. But when we, uh, in 1991, the government decided in its own wisdom that the nationalization should be reversed and we should all be, all the state enterprises should be privatized. But I must say that we, we had a very healthy uh, balance sheet as long as we were in the, in the public sector. And we had uh, a lot of support from the government, so there was no interference from the other government departments, which I think was the best benefit that we could derive in the public sector. So in 1991, when the government decided that we should um, denationalize and reprivatize all the companies or as many companies as possible, of which some are still uh, pending as <laughs> that uh, steel mill and some of the other loss-making units are still still uh, within the government's uh, uh, support and, uh, and gambit. So we, we got denationalized in 1991. And here again, I was supported by the by one of our ministers, Saeed Khadir, who said that we should go in for an employee buyout, which was a new experience in the country. Pakistan, um, there weren't any very many companies that had gone for an employee buyout in, in, from the public sector till then. So we uh, put a consortium together and with the help of the bankers and the support of bankers, we were able to put in a bid which was, which was the highest. We were five contestants um, in which uh, the employees were, uh, there were two parties of the employees who were participating, ours being the highest bid, we were handed over the company after that. But then um, the experiences that we faced being in the private sector immediately after an employee buyout, which was a very, very difficult position. I think we went through a very, very difficult time. And I think um, uh, we had all sorts of problems. We had to contest legal cases. The, 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 the uh, parties who were also the second party from the employees uh, took us to court, uh, in which some vested interests were involved. And um, we fought the case in the courts and we had to go to the Supreme Court level to be able to win them. And uh, um, the government then handed over the, the shares of the company to us. And we were, we were a group of three or more than 350 employees who, were, who had participated in the employee buyout. And we were, able to, we were able to start managing the company. But that wasn't the end of our, our uh, problems. Uh, they, we were again challenged in, in agencies by agencies like FIA, challenged by other government departments, and we had a lot of difficulty in trying to sustain ourselves. But by the grace of God, we were able to do so, and we continued to continue to struggle and move on quite successfully. Uh, so much so that, you know, we, we were, uh, even uh, NAB had taken us to court, and they were investigating our privatization 
instead of doing that with the government and with the privatization commission they were asking us all sorts of questions even today uh, after 30 years of having been privatized we are still answering questions to nab they are still asking us what and how it was done and we have to bring back papers which were 30 years old dig them out and hand them over to, to nab so far we've been able to keep above water keep our heads above water and hopefully we'll be able to do that but the important thing is that we moved we moved in the public sector we had gone up to about 15000 tractors a year we have now been able to move on to about 40000 tractors in a um, cyclical manner and uh, it has been very successful and more important than that is that we have been able to develop the ancillary industry which is now the backbone of the auto sector in this country and we have got more than 350 vending units supplying parts to us and in value terms we produce almost 90% to 92% parts of tractors in pakistan now that i think is is an achievement which was which has come on the back of the public sector i cannot take the full credit for that i think it was the public sector that really uh, laid the foundation for it and uh, we were able to we were able to build on that now how why was this successful i think it was successful because we have a, we had a good management team we had a team which was uh, which was very very uh, cohesive and we were able to we were able to move ahead uh, without any anybody pulling each other's legs and pulling us down which was often the case in the public sector but now we have been able to stay together it is the same board that we had 30 years ago and we are uh, the, the the private sector members keep changing but the main members of the of miller tractors who are supported who are um, who are managing the company i have remained the same we have gone from uh, um, management uh, functions ourselves and we have come on the board and we have professional managers now managing and this was something that we had learned again from the public sector in the public sector when we we sent our boys for training they came back and i think we developed the level and skills of management i think istiqbal mehdi will bear me out that he was also instrumental in in supporting that to a large extent and being in the uh, institution like uh, um, i think he he was in charge of uh, what was it called expert advisory cell and a special technical cell expert advisory cell at expert advisory cell and they were they were in they were supporting us they were there to support us but that wasn't the case when we were privatized and we really had to really struggle hard to be able to uh, to stay afloat anyway so that was that was what it was and um, i think um, i i think the experience in the public sector to me as a, as an individual and as a company has been very good i think it was it is it is not to the uh, the the uh, nationalization that creates a problem is the management of the company somehow it has been very unfortunate that most of the companies that are uh, that are even today as i see them and as has been displayed just now uh, they are they are companies which which should be profitable i know the transportation railways etc are are a different uh, uh, but uh, discos and others they they can be made made profitable with proper management in my opinion and good comment support could certainly be of help so uh, i thank you uh, i don't know whether i have conveyed what uh, was ex expected of me but i think uh, uh, my uh, final analysis is that public sector can be good only if you have the right kind of management if you do not select people who are who are coming on merit they will never function the private sector uh, functions well because it chooses the right people and places the right people at the right spot so that, that you can you can make the uh, the most of your uh, opportunity that there is so thank you very much again i i hope uh, it's been interesting but my life uh, span with miller tractors has been extremely interesting it has gone up from private to public to private and now i'm uh, i'm happy that i i have i have been i cheat, uh, took the decision of joining miller tractor at the time when it was really down down in the dumps thank you very much thank you istiqbal thank you nadeem nadeem sir
Thank you very Christian. much. Thank you very much. Very, very, I think a very interesting example of a successful privatization and a successful enterprise. So there you go. We've got uh, the problem identified by Akshat um, It's not a large problem, but it is but it is a large problem. It's a heterogeneous problem, not that every enterprise is loss-making, but nevertheless, the losses of the state-owned enterprises to my account, and Rashid can correct me on this, I think amount to something like 30% of revenues. So we are in the continuous binge of trying to collect revenues while we are losing uh, in the state-owned enterprises. So quite frankly, this is a sieve into which we are pouring our revenues. So Sneem, so why don't you come in and you tell us what is wrong with the management of these enterprises? Everybody agrees that they can be managed well, but yet we make a hash of managing them. Take, for example, the energy companies. I mean, I think they're in a management disaster. Uh, why are they a management? Railway. Railway is a management disaster. Why is it a management disaster? Even NHA. NHA has very good assets. It should be able to run its own business, but it can't. So where is the problem, this means, sir? Well, thank you, uh, Nadeem, and thank you, Sikbal, for organizing this. And uh, uh, <laughs> the two uh, presentations, Ashad Saab and Sikandas, have been uh, very revealing in, in the sense that, you know, sort of they recall a lot of things that one has been uh, practicing. Mm -hmm. I uh, come in, uh, like Ashad Saab is an economist, and uh, um, Sikandar is uh, the person who's had experience in one industry. I've had uh, a very multifarious experience in the and hands-on experience in the public sector, especially in the golden era of the public sector, which was until the 80s. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, and of course, Nadeem would criticize that, but I was um, uh, a general manager in the Punjab Industrial Development Board at one time managing rice mills, you know, those, those are the times when we were trying to protect uh, things in the, in the Punjab government had set up small rice husking and polishing mills. Then I was managing director of Pakistan Mineral Development Corporation in the uh, early 80s. And in that capacity, I was looking after coal and, and uh, salt manufacture because I have a degree in geology. So I was, you know, then, uh, then I started the Punjab Mineral Development Corporation in Punjab. Uh, the Punjabin, because public sector has been always shy to get into the mineral uh, industry. Then later on, I joined the uh, Ministry of Interior as a deputy secretary. And I, you know, the government sent me for an MBA at uh, you know uh, this Harvard Business School set up an institute in Tehran. So I went and did my MBA there, and then I came back and they sent me uh, to the State Cement Corporation as kind of you know vice chairman director of finance. So there was a kind of career planning in those days. And um, in my personal experience in public sector organizations, I found that there were no serious uh, issues of massive losses, um, except perhaps in the coal mines, you know, at that time, because the technology was low. But for instance, in my capacity as a uh, director of finance and the vice chairman of the State Cement Corporation, we were managing all the cement industries of the country, there were about, I think, 19 cement mills. And we were taking care of the management uh, of the marketing, of the procurement, of the financing. Now, obviously, what was happening was that that was the model that worked. You know, all the general managers or MDs of those companies were professionals. Uh, within this corporation, we had uh, a finance, we had a you know, sort of general manager of finance who was a chartered accountant from the private sector. So the, the uh, you know, persons, people like me were really overseeing and supervising and not interfering in the operation. As a matter of fact, supporting them with the government, with the regulators, with the tax issues, with the uh, local. So we were like the, the, the troubleshooters for those uh, and, you know, making and, and of course monitors at that time. So the public sector, and then, of course, as in this in the Ministry of Interior, uh, we were responsible, you know, Ministry of Interior at that time when nationalization took place, we were looking after all the cement industry, all the fertilizer industry, all the chemical industry, all the auto industry. And uh, the expert advisory cell was the consulting arm, which did all the analysis, the professional analysis of the results, technical analysis of the results. And that was kind of the thinking arm of the ministry. And we took, uh, you know, where the professional advice was required in taking taking decisions. Uh, 
um, the expert advisory cell came to our rescue, which kind of thing, I don't know whether it really exists in the government anymore or not. So, um, uh, you know, as Sikandar says, uh, in those days, why they were successful then? Because there was no political interference. There was no media um, mischief. There was no, uh, you know, unnecessary exposure of everything. And uh, the government was so sensitive to price hike that I remember um, Kamar Idris Saab, a very respected person, was an additional secretary in the Ministry of Production, and he authorized a one rupee increase in, the, in a bag of cement. And he was hauled up at the federal level, you know, the, the government was very uh, annoyed and, you know, uh, he had to face a lot of uh, shouting matches. Uh, so that was the kind of control that the government had and um, the, 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 I suppose, uh, since it was managed by the private sector or the, the individuals, there was no uh, thing about excessive profiteering or excessive black marketing or, uh, you know, sort of uh, the other issues that are currently there, which are pushing uh, uh, prices uh, uh, higher. But having said that, what Nadeem has said, that currently, you know, we are on paper losing about seven, eight hundred, nine hundred billion rupees a year on public sectors. Now, if uh, they are of the industries that are inevitably to be done, obviously public sector, uh, nobody wants to privatize education. Nobody wants to privatize educate health. Nobody wants to privatize infrastructure, which is the responsibility of the state. You can't provide, privatize the military. You can't provide, privatize the uh, law enforcement agencies. So those are integral part of the public sector. And I think uh, there is no debate and there should be no debate about privatizing them. But marginal issues like PIA, like steel mill, like, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm surprised to uh, see, hear that Sindh Engineering is losing more money than PSM. Uh, but if uh, Sindh Engineering is losing, I don't know what it, is, what it is doing with so many private sector auto industries. So therefore, uh, governments have not shown the courage and the will. Uh, for instance, this government, uh, you know, should have been doing what they are trying to do with PSM now, two and a half years later. They have, uh, you know, they are talking seriously about uh, privatizing it. They should have done that the first day they, they came, but they were at that time pandering up to the uh, thing. So those are the things I think which give a bad image to the government. Uh, the um, the discourse again, as uh, Sikandar said, are something that that is an overall issue of uh, electricity. The the problem with our uh, with our country is that the problems have become so large, like in the in the electricity in the in the power sector. You know we are losing again six to seven or eight hundred billion rupees a year and circular debt increasing and you know it's gone up to what 1.8 trillion and i don't see any um sort of you know light at the end of the tunnel and uh, nobody has any ready answers for that those are the worrying things as far as the public sector are concerned and uh, our government has has uh, committed too much no country of our economic value promises a person gas in every village and nook and corner of the country, piped gas. You know, uh, no country, in, I suppose a country like ours cannot really afford to provide electricity to all nook and corners of the country. You know, uh, I think there has to be some decision keeping in view your own resources. Now, what has happened is that because we have given that as, an, as a given, as an expectation, uh, governments have really wagered their future on just the power sector. And I, I fear that the power sector is perhaps the one which is going to take the country down. When I read the newspapers and you see the, the kind of losses and the kind of debt issues that you have to, now you've reached a stage where you have to uh, mortgage your roads and mortgage your parks, you know, um, there has to be some serious thinking. The MIMF issue is the other one. I, I, I'm, I'm not very sure whether the governments have not denationalized because of the IMF 
you know, the uh, sort of uh, issues. The issue is that the governments have not have, have not denationalized because um, they don't have the political will. There are these are really job. Uh, uh, some of these I'm not talking of again. I'm uh, the, the the areas that I listed out are something that are different, but the uh, the other 20 percent or at least 30 percent which are making loss making are the ones with the government should challenge, and I don't think that uh, this like PIA, I feel that the government should really declare bankruptcy. How is the US economy really surviving? There's so many ventures and so many, they have a system of declaring bankruptcy at a certain stage and then going restart and again. Here we are trying to fix PIA by bringing in new things. We are trying to fix the railways by unbundling, having tried that in WAPTA and you know seen the results. So, um, you know, we have to uh, really take some bold decisions as early as possible. Otherwise, the debt trap that we are in uh, is doesn't bode well for the country. Thank you. Dr. Nadeem, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, the same sir. Thank you very much. So there we have it. We have uh, state -owned enterprises can be run well. <clears throat> enterprise is an enterprise. It doesn't matter how you run it well. The question is why is it run badly? And I think this is the question that we should all come to. So let's take Salim Raza on this. Salim Raza, sab ye bataiye ke humne banks privatize kar diye. Aur bada hum sochte humne mar ka mara. But kya banko ki service better hogi hai logon ke liye ya people are still suffering? Have the is the bank profitability Dependent on competition, yeah. Just like I say, that banks' ka jo model is simple. Hai. Ten, four, two, which is basically take the take government deposits at four, lend at ten, and go for golf at two. So, my meaning is that we have privatization achieved. That the small, small salaries are getting bank CEOs, ko, but yet the banking services have really depreciated over our lifetime. Salim Raza, sir, what's your take on? Public sector <clears throat> and banking in particular. Gee. There are, given everything that's been discussed, the two, three things I want to touch upon. Mm -hmm. But let me start with uh, the issue you've raised privatizing banking. Mm -hmm. We are unusually, um, unusually among emerging markets, private sector dominated uh, in terms of banking ownership, 80%, uh, where we have nothing effectively, nothing is uh, in the area of development finance. You know, the, when you talk about SOEs, some of the biggest SOEs and the most effective SOEs are financial SOEs in emerging markets. Everywhere, you know, China, Korea in its growth stage, <clears throat> Brazil today, uh, all the development, different development banks in India. So development banks who work as, who have, uh, advisory capacity on subjects, you know, besides lending capacity. So for the SME and for the agri, they, they work alongside them and they build their capacity. And then infrastructure finance banks, which allow you to structure projects based on the cash flow of the project, which we cannot do. Um, because because our, our private banks, like private banks everywhere, do what, you know, comes naturally to them, which is a prime shareholder obligation. They want to stay liquid and they want to stay profitable. So they lend short term and they lend for working capital. Mm -hmm. So we have no capacity in this country for project finance and we have no development finance capacity for the SME and agriculture. This was not always the case. It was notably not the case in the 60s. We've let some good institutions fade away. I think in the hope that the private sector would do it, not understanding that nowhere in the world does the private sector enter mm. uh, development finance alone. It gets crowded in by after leaderships given uh, uh, by public sector enterprises. Uh, and that infrastructure finance is always done on a PPP basis, public and private participation. We don't have those structures. Mm. Our, our power generation is not PPP. I mean, the government pays the bill. That's why banks finance them, because they're financing a government bond. Today, our position is that 
uh, of our private banks, something like 65% of their loanable assets are to government. 50% in uh, PIBs and securities, 15% in government guaranteed lending, be it IPPs, uh, uh, be, it, be it PIA, <clears throat> Uh, be it commodity finance, you know, there's about almost uh, 800 billion rupees of commodity finance debt uh, guaranteed by the government. And this is this is primarily wheat, but it's also what DCP buys, fertilizer, sugar, etc. So, so first of all, we've got this huge void in development finance, and that I wouldn't blame our private sector banks for that because they were never meant to do it. So when we went in for this vast privatization, we left this this gaping obvious hole of who's going to carry the responsibility for developing those segments where, the, where private sector banks would automatically not take the lead. They'll follow, but they won't take the lead. That's one issue. Uh, and, and I think it's a very, very overdue. It's, it's come up many times. We've talked about setting up an infrastructure finance bank. It hasn't happened. Uh, we went very far once in 2010. We thought we had one ready to go, but it sort of faded away, twinkling like a star somewhere in the sky. And then people talk about it now and then, but um, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. It doesn't go forward. Now let me, let me go back to the you know what Mr. Arshad Zaman had said earlier, and some of the comments that you made. And since the subject I was given was financing, um, SOE is funny. I, 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 the big issue. SOEs are you know can be purely commercial, or they can have public sector obligations, or they can be a mixture of both. So purely commercial is obvious. That's what it is. You know so. Usually airlines, uh, uh, mining, energy, telecom, et cetera, in the public sector run as purely commercial entities. Public service obligation entities are things like water supply, some forms of transportation, the postal service, et cetera. And some are both because, for instance, in power, the government may, may want the smaller consumers financed and some things that's below the cost of uh, delivery. So, so you've got you've got a, a mixture of things. Now let's take the the purely commercial. The way to finance the purely, if you, if the purely commercial <clears throat> are to be sustainable, they have to be financed on market terms. They have to be financed on the same terms as a private sector company in the same field or in a different field, but on terms on which the private sector would get financed. That would mean <clears throat> that would mean that the company has to be able to control its debt equity levels. It has to say that this is the debt equity ratio we'll maintain. It has to uh, <clears throat> target and, and try and meet an IRR, that's an internal rate of return. And number three, it has to have complete control over its dividend policy. If it doesn't, the government will extract value. The risk is the government for budgetary reasons will extract value from the PSEs. And we talked about our profitable PSEs. You know, we talked about PSO, we talked about uh, OGDC, uh, there's the national bank as well. There's the state bank. The state bank makes money from invested from, from all the debt that it sits on, government debt. Now, all this is taken out in a, in a budgetary sense. So, so we, and, and government as the sole shareholder bears the obligation to build the, to build, uh, the investment uh, or the, the investment, uh, you know, build up the capacity of SOEs in time whenever equity is needed, new capital plans, expansion, and the government never does. All these things get taken care of by subsidies or, or by, you know, some form of debt floated off to, you know, foreign shareholders in the form of some spook or the other. So, so our, 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 our commercial entities uh, that ought to be able to manage their debt uh, like a private entity cannot because they cannot control their, their, their dividends which are extracted they, they cannot dictate their debt equity levels it mustn't get worse than this and uh, and they cannot uh, you know they're not independently they're not able to meet irrs they've established themselves now what's the what's the solution and what you can you know these temptations for government to uh, strip out are there everywhere in the world uh, OECD's, uh, OECD has done a lot of work in the last two, three years. I mean, I agree with uh, Mr. Arshad Zaman. I think there's a big return to focusing on governance in SE, SOEs because this love affair with privatization, I'm not saying it's run its course, but um, it's certainly for the moment slowing down. And now there's a concern that SOEs are going to be picked. 
as a gentleman from the IMF uh, who spoke a little earlier said, something like 20% of global asset investment in productive enterprise is in SOEs. And in countries, up to 45% of national output comes out of SOEs. And sectors like, you know, again, mining, energy, telecom are dominated in many countries by SOEs. So, so they're a fact of life. And you're going to have to work with them. And you're going to have to make them, going back to finance, you're going to have to make them their finance market sustainable, sustainable on market terms, cold nose, nose lenders should be able to come and look at them. How, how, do, you, how do you establish uh, what's the consensus? So the OECD view has been, and I think the World Bank would support this, uh, is that you, your, your company has to be able to meet a certain debt rate, a certain credit rate given by the you know, global rating agencies uh, so that it can raise debt on competitive terms. The, 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 its rating has to be uh, investment grade. Now, then work backwards. We can't hear you, Salu. I can hear him fine. Um, I can hear him fine. Oh, oh. Huh. So, Sorry, is this better? Arshad? Go ahead, go ahead. I can hear you fine. I think they check Korea up to both may hoga shut koi computer may problem hoga. I can hear him fine. Chali, go ahead. Go ahead. So 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 what they what they are doing in Europe, in many countries in Europe, is Establishing that the SOEs will maintain a certain mark, market credit rating so they can raise debt on competitive terms so that they can perform competitively and sort of genuinely produce revenue for government instead of having it extracted <coughs> before they've even made it. Uh, so, so it's the bond rating that you then work backwards from. For this bond rating, what IRR targets do you need? What de debt, uh, debt uh, equity ratio do you need? And what? Uh, and what your you what your uh, your company's control board's control on dividends must be, in other words, uh, the level of dividends uh, dividends recommended by the board should be final. We know that with government that's not always possible, but at least if we had an agreement like that, we had benchmarks like a bond rating, uh, that would be a start. I'm not saying we can work towards it tomorrow. We are so we are very far away from it. And 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 you know, being as far away as we are, our path back is 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 going to need a lot of changes in the in how government regards SOEs um, and and financing SOEs and what it regards them as. Does it regard them as entities for the future, or as uh, you know albatrosses around the neck that they must dispose of one way or the other? If we can debate privatization of anything, uh, was it necessary? Was it good? Doesn't matter. Here we are. We stand with ownership of certain things. You know, we can. We can make them work. They did work once. Uh, anyway, uh, so so that's that's uh, you know the criteria for financing SOEs is you have to be able to give them competitive equivalence with market companies. Uh, then, I think associated with this, I've mentioned the lack of development finance institutions. That is something we can fix tomorrow. I mean, I honestly don't see any reason. I see no reason for continuing navel gazing. A lot of suggestions have been made of how these institutions can be created. A vast number in the past five or six years, in the past 10 years. So let me just leave that aside. We've got to have them. Without them, we cannot go forward. Our banking sector, I've told you for very good reason, will not fill that very, very critical space that is necessary for our development. The third thing I wanted to say is that we've got to think of the management structure for our SOEs. I, I mean the overall overarching management structure. You know, there's, as you know, there's a spectrum in which uh, spectrum of ways in which SOEs are managed. They're managed as underlying ministries. They're managed and uh, basically managed in three ways. There are overlaps, uh, and there are uh, exceptions everywhere. But basically, three ways. One is underlying ministries. The other is dual, uh, the line ministry and the finance ministry or the planning ministry, and the third is centralized. So decentralized, dual control, and centralized. Centralized is there's either a coordinating agency that coordinates the needs of all the SOEs with the uh, relevant ministries, or uh, what I think is probably the best way, there's a holding company. There's a holding company for all the SOEs. That's what China has, um, called SASAC, State Asset Supervision and Administration Committee. And that is what that is the way a lot of Asia has gone, Thailand, uh, not Thailand, 
uh, so much Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and that's the way a lot of European countries are going. Uh, have a holding company. That holding company board of the have a holding company and then have boards at the sector level because there'll be three, four, five, six sectors that that your public sector enterprises consist of, and then there'll be the boards of the individual companies. So you've got three levels of boards, uh, and you've got what you get, what you extract from a holding structure is you have synergy, uh, you have transfer of talent, opportunity for development of ta talent, long-term career planning, and you feed your, your leadership from inside uh, these entities. You don't fly people in from the government, you know, for six months or nine months or one year to manage them. You can attach people from government as coordinators, but the management has... So what structure do we want? We are presently underlying ministries, or sort of underlying ministries. I'm not quite clear that our ministries really have authority over the companies that fall in their remit. But uh, so, so certainly now this Sarmaya that's been talked about, I think st is still a twinkle in someone's eye. I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, I know a committee has been established now to, uh, uh, you know, look at taking the idea forward, but, uh, you know, I, I, Let's see what happens. It's, uh, but I think uh, in my recommendation uh, very strongly is this holding company structure. So these two, three things, revival of development lending, figuring out how we can make our commercial companies financeable on market terms, and uh, number three, uh, what's, what framework uh, of ownership uh, do we want uh, our SOEs to, to, um, SOEs to function under? I mean, the three critical functions of the ownership really are uh, appointing the board, setting and monitoring object performance objectives, and voting, voting the shares on behalf of the company. Who's going to do it? You know, if you've got line ministries, different line ministries, you've got very, very different patterns, uh, very different ideas, very, and you can run into each other, you can replicate, you can block each other. Uh, a holding company will clear, will unclutter all that. Uh, and I think it'll have a lot more elegance and effectiveness. Anyway, that's just a thought. One, by the way, one final word. Um, agriculture is, you know, long, uh, long neglected, we know that. But uh, I, I would, you know, recommend that you look up, uh, if you have 10 minutes, just look up MDRAPA. Uh, this is Brazil's Agricultural Research Organization, E-M-B-R-A-P-A. It is phenomenal. Brazil is the world's second largest exporting country for agriculture, about $82 billion. They're the world's biggest exporters of soya. Soya is not a tropical crop. Brazil is a tropical country. Soya is a temperate crop. It needs four seasons. Now, how did Brazil develop it? Intense research. This Embrapa has 2,500 PhDs, 10,000 staff. Uh, Embrapa has 45 centers of excellence. Centers of excellence. Each center of excellence is devoted to some aspect of improve crop productivity or livestock productivity or, uh, you know, or growth um, or, or, or change in, you know, in the pattern of planting, you know, from forest to field to, you know, whatever, uh, you know, to, for sort of resurgence of the soil. Uh, and, this, and then it has 11 uh, centers of, <coughs> centers working on, on common themes, like, uh, for example, uh, you know, better water management, mm -hmm. like, seed development, like soil development. Um, and and that, that is primarily responsible, that, that research organization, you know, which is funded by government, funded by multinationals, by the multilaterals. It has research branches across Africa. It brought Indian cattle, Nelor, I think the, the name of the cattle was, to Brazil, and uh, sort of experimented with, you know, uh, strengthening the, the, the national... Um, you know, the, the natural build of the animal and is now it's the world's second largest beef exporter. Uh, and the bulk of their product is this Indian cattle. So they've adapted it, improved it, and they do this with a lot of stuff they bring across from Africa. Uh, so we have nothing like that. And then as an agricultural country, I mean, that is the biggest missing hole. We know that. Um, so, so I think, you know, development finance supplemented by research all these things that, that I've mentioned, I think, uh, you know, time to discuss, think about, you know, but, but decide on. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're going to continue to go around in circles as we have been doing. And 
the PSC, uh, I, haven't even, I haven't used the word privatization. I'm just talking about organization. Uh, and we can decide whether we want to privatize some of these or do what. But you know, fix your fix how you're going to manage them and decide what you want out of them first. Thank you. Thank you, Salim Sir. Thank you very much. G. Istakbal Mehdi Sir, pull it together. जो मुझे नजर आ रहा है इशू जो मैं नोट्स लेता रहा हूँ मुझे तो लग रहा है कि ये सबसे बड़ा एक मैनेजमेंट का इशू है और इस कंट्री में इस मुल्क में हम कुछ भी मैनेज नहीं कर सकते ये भी एक अजीब चीज है जो मैं पैनल के सामने रखना चाहता हूँ कि बड़ी अजीब चीज है हमारी कंट्री एक वाहिद कंट्री है मेरा ख्याल जहाँ सबसे बड़े एंटरप्राइजेज स्टॉक मार्केट पे पब्लिक सेक्टर ओन्ड एंटरप्राइजेज हैं और ये भी नहीं कि उनमें कोई बहुत बड़ी फाइनेंसिंग हो रही है दस दस पंद्रह पंद्रह परसेंट पे वो बने हुए हैं प्राइवेटाइज होती हैं और जनाब पी एस ओ की मेरे ख्याल दस परसेंट प्राइवेटाइज हुई है लार्जेस्ट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इन द कंट्री बट आई वॉन्ट यू टू फोकस नीम साहब ये जो सारी बातें की खुदा यू आर आर्किटेक्ट आप पुलिट टुगेदर और ये बताइए मैनेजमेंट इशू है क्या पब्लिक सेक्टर एंटरप्राइज के बोर्ड देखता हूँ और मैं अपने दोस्तों से पूछता हूँ जो अच्छे इकोनॉमिक अच्छे लोग हैं पढ़े लिखे लोग हैं वो तो किसी बोर्ड पर भी नहीं है कौन है बोर्ड पे अभी हमने बोर्ड्स का एक एनालिसिस किया पीआईडी में बोर्ड्स पे एक छोटी सी सारे बोर्ड पे प्राइवेट और पब्लिक ये भी सुनने वाली बात है सलीम साहब तस्नीम साहब हमने बोर्ड्स का एनालिसिस किया बोर्ड्स पे सिर्फ कराची लाहौर इस्लामाबाद मेनली कराची कराची के सिंध क्लब के मेंबर्स बोर्ड्स पे हैं या थोड़े ब्यूरोक्रेट्स हैं या थोड़े जनरल हैं सोसाइटी के बंदे बोर्ड्स पे कोई नहीं है लाहौर में आ जाए पंजाब क्लब के मेंबर्स है तो बोर्ड्स द वेरी स्मॉल क्लब तो हम बोर्ड्स को ट्रस्ट कर सकते हैं सलीम साहब कहते हैं सरमाया बनाए तो बोर्ड्स में तो वही मेंबर्स आएंगे जो क्लब सिंध क्लब पंजाब क्लब के मेंबर्स है इज ए नो बडी एल्स इन दर्ल्ड इन द कंट्री तो इसका मतलब हमारा तो बहुत बड़ा मैनेजमेंट चल जाए इकबाल साहब बताइए थैंक यू सो मच सलीम वॉट अ प्लेजर इट इज टूडे लिस्निंग टू ऑल द्रेट स्कॉलर एक्सपर्ट एंड प्रोफेशनल Uh, one of the unique um, uh, thing uh, what i'm hearing today is uh, is nothing uh, public sector is not being condemned typically when you go to anywhere in pakistan and you talk about public and private sector the first thing you hear is about the condemning what what a what a uh, curse public sector ha- has been and i wanted to basically nadeem i wanted to give a very quick brief about um, one of the success stories is uh, uh, we in pakistan we have had at your um, i this addresses to the question and issue we you have just raised what is wrong with our, uh, our management why don't we have uh, a successful management here in pakistan um i shall start uh, my state enterprises uh, experience in pakistan uh, in the 50s and 60s public enterprises in pakistan was reasonably doing well and uh, in fact to the extent that i i confess that uh, in some of the uh, the places where i went for you know consultancy and advice in many other countries i used to take pakistan as a model um and i used to that in pakistan state enterprises as a model well of course those were the different days anyway let me let me talk about it that um, public enterprises uh, uh, were doing reasonably well till we had this uh, uh, nationalization of early 1970s which added the public more public enterprises and the result was that we had uh, uh, 29 manufacturing enterprises uh, uh, already which were called the pidc uh, uh, public enterprises added uh, adding to them was another 33 nationalized unit making them 62 the problem was that the nationalization did take place but nobody had thought how it is going to be managed the result was that 62 public enterprises pakistan never had an experience of managing 62 public and large public enterprises as and uh, this kind of conglomerate was somehow uh, had to be managed and to manage that the government typically a, a you know set up number of uh, committees commissions and all of them and all of them had everyone except the professionals uh, who 
knew about public sector enterprises, the specific issues and the problems of public enterprises. And the result was that uh, uh, the whole of 1970s uh, up to early 1980s, we have had some of the worst management of public sector enterprises. The country which had experience of, you know, fairly good experience of uh, enterprises like Vabda and, you know, uh, um, many other institutions in the financial sector suddenly had uh, these heavy losses loss incurring public sector enterprises. Till in early 1980s, we have had uh, an experience uh, of uh, uh, setting up um, uh, what is it called uh, the expert advice cell by the Ministry of Production. And I can tell you one thing, it was not really a very well thought out uh, um, uh, uh, set up in the beginning. It was just considered that there should be, uh, there should be no board of industrial management, which was uh, managing uh, the earlier public sector enterprises. That board of industrial management should be winded up and it should be replaced by an independent agency a called expert advice cell to advise the, the administrative ministry called Ministry of Production. The, uh, the experience of uh, the expert advice cell was uh, were relatively unique. It was an advisory board full of professionals advising the Ministry of Production to how to uh, control the enterprises and uh, who would know better than uh, uh, Tasneem Nurani sitting there, who uh, they are, uh, we were uh, really uh, starting a new game uh, uh, of uh, managing enterprises by the ministries, but with the advice of the professionals. And for a change, uh, one of the unique experience where the professionals were advised was really taken, not necessarily the advice that professionals were, were all that good and uh, a thing, but it was just basically a good discussion and interaction between the public sector uh, uh, enterprises management and the, the bureaucrats uh, in the Ministry of Production. And it was one of the unique experience of uh, success. How, was, how did it take place? And if I can tell you how we started that, it was basically uh, uh, a, a program of reforming state enterprises was launched. And the first thing we, we addressed uh, was, uh, this um, was the setting up of the autonomy structure. And the autonomy structure for a change was not uh, just uh, allowing the manager to do just um, uh, what they wanted to do, but based on uh, some well thought out uh, scheme, which we had actually borrowed from, from the two very well known um, uh, scholars uh, from, uh, uh, from the US, they had prepared, uh, they had advised and uh, uh, suggested uh, uh, autonomy structure for the uh, uh, for the large um, private sector enterprises, and those uh, the basically this autonomy structure had identified that the owner should do only six things: set objectives, evaluate performance according to those objectives, reward and penalize chief executive appoint the chief executive officer, provide resources, conduct long range planning and coordination. And the seventh, most important, do nothing else. And this was probably the most important thing, do nothing else. Not that we completely followed this, but we somehow took the spirit of this kind of recommendation. And the result was that uh, there were the, uh, there were 75 industrial enterprises under the Ministry of Production at that time who were being managed through a holding, eight holding corporations. And those old eight holding corporations were managing um, uh, the, these uh, 
75 industrial and uh, industrial uh, enterprises under the control of the board of directors who were relatively speaking really autonomous and following the adopting and using the autonomy of in the real sense what exactly did we do we adopted the autonomy structure we followed um, uh, adopted another enterprise uh, system called the signaling system for state owned enterprises and if i could mention one thing that this has been generally the experience all over the, the world that uh, the let me let me shift to um where yes that's right this is the international experience that uh, the performance evaluation has been relatively relatively weak in the public sector enterprise why basic basically two reasons one is generally known that they have multiple objectives they have commercial as well as non commercial but another one is the plural principles different organs in the government have different perceptions about the goals of the enterprise the ministry of labor will look at the or look after the interest of the labor or the manpower the ministry of commerce will look after the interest of of uh, the trading side of the enterprise and you know uh, various other areas so every element of the government organ had a different perception about the objective of that enterprise it was this kind of combination of the two various kind of of of, of uh, objectives which each one of them thought the public enterprise should be doing and the result was obviously that uh, the enterprise manager could not identify the exact objective what is it he is supposed to do is he supposed to to set up uh, 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 um, the enterprise uh, uh, the well managed enterprise or is he supposed to construct a road which he is getting an indication from the government to set up a go road or provide education to to the uh, you know the area where the, the uh, enterprise is located the result was that there was a confusion complete confusion of uh, um, of the multiplicity of of objectives how do we do that we have had set up a very unique uh, experience of uh, what is it called the signaling system of public enterprises which revolved around the performance evaluation performance evaluation of the manager what how do we do that how do we do that is first of all exactly identify what is the key performance indicator they should adopt and it was it took us about 2 to 3 years working on the various some of the most complex uh, uh, these criteria which we had developed to find out what exactly and to work on the development of those those uh, criteria how do how do we uh, identify what is it the enterprise should be doing and what is it which they should be a, a, a performing and how those performance should be assessed that is another element which had to be worked out the result was that uh, we came out we developed this three years uh, work on the what is it called public profit and the private profit and public profit we had worked out you know working to identify what is it which we can get out of an enterprise which means what is it it the box which we have the black box and what is it we can get out of that the result is that we were able to identify at the end of the day that if there is any one criteria which really is 
able to identify what enterprise should be doing is profit. Profit, okay, but assessing it in the correct manner. There are areas which are, which are not supposed to be assessed. They are not supposed to be done by the enterprise, but there are other areas which the, the manager does it for, uh, the, um, for the enterprise, but it is not assessed at the time of evaluation. So the result was that we had to work out a simple way of, of uh, assessing the evaluation of the, what, and I would like to show a, a, a performance contract which we had adopted. Profitability, yes, certainly is. We should be, it was profit divided by total assets, thousand profitability. But in that, the profit should be assessed correctly. I'm not going to go into the detail, but that should be. The subsequent um, uh, partial indicators will indicate why this becomes a relevant uh, criteria of evaluation. Physical production by fine, fine. At once we have established the profitability as the primary criteria, the important thing is that it should be assessed by the real prof productivity. How do we do that? That is by the way we identified four major uh, cost which an enterprise, a manufacturing enterprise is uh, incurs. One is he buys the raw material. Second, he expends, you know, the, the uh, electricity which he incurs, uh, you know, the cost of electricity which he incurs, gas, furnace oil, labor cost, financial expense. So if you are attaining that target of the profitability, which is also linked with these real costs, because here we are assessing the real cost, not in terms of financial cost, but in terms of the real cost, which means the value, value of those costs. The labor cost, how much you are paying to the labor, to the financial expenses, how much you are paying for the borrowing which you have you have, uh, have borrowed, and what kind of cost you you have uh, to pay for that, and electricity, not in terms of what has been the price of electricity, let's say, which was uh, 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 x last year, and this year it is x minus one which means that it is a cheaper electricity and then I'm showing a good profitability. No, I have to show exactly at the same price where I had assessed and had set up the target for those enterprise uh, electricity consumption. So the result was that we have been able to evaluate the performance of the enterprise by way of assessing uh, comparing it with the target. Now, when I say comparing it with the target, that is where the greatest issue which came. How do you set the right targets? And that is a very, very difficult task. And who would know better than uh, uh, Sikandar that uh, sometime the expert advice cell people sat down with the team of uh, Sikandar and Sikandar being a tough, you know, managing director, we, we sometimes spend the whole day coming out, uh, coming to, uh, to some point and some agreement. And finally, we always came to this agreement of, of uh, assessing, uh, uh, reaching a certain target. Um, uh, um. Now, target setting was, is one of the most critical element in the performance evaluation. Generally, when you go to an enterprise or you, um, uh, or you go to any public sector enterprise, they will set up a target where, which is a letter from, from the ministry 
that you are supposed to attain this and this and this. In case of expert advice cell, the managing director was invited. The managing before the managing director's team was invited, they had sent uh, on a certain budgetary proposals, which the, the unique thing about those budgetary proposal was that the cost and the value or the cost and the price was always, had, there was a breakup of that. So we could always see what is exactly the, the total cost in the real, in the real terms, not in terms of the prices of last year and this year and showing the profit, but just because the prices, uh, the profit has, uh, the prices have in, declined or prices have gone up. The result was that we were able to come out and compare the profit, uh, what should be the profit at the end of the year. Now the problem which is always there that at the beginning of the year, you always set up a target, but during the course of the year, things change. Things change and there is what assumption you have established or assumed at the time of, of uh, the, the setting of the target, things have by that time changed. So for, to, to address that issue, we had set up a very, uh, I must say relatively uh, at that time, uh, relatively efficient MIS system. The MIS, it was one of the first few or uh, um, uh, uh, the ministry where uh, uh, MIS was established um, uh, and uh, our advisors who are, uh, who had developed that MIS for us uh, in the expert advice cell. Only today I was seeing they are one of the leading um, uh, um, uh, software uh, uh, firm. Uh, I can mention the name, it is, uh, uh, Systems Limited, uh, who uh, um, who had done this job for us, and we were able to. So the objective was that uh, the MIS was an early warning system provided us that if their assumption was wrong, then we could always go to the ministry, we could always go to the relevant people and indicate that look the assumption on which a budget was formed or the budget was made, now this has to change. And I can give you an example. There was a, there was a, a, a fertilizer factory not very far from here in Hazara called Park China Fertilizer Factory. And uh, its capacity at that time, it was a small uh, urea fertilizer uh, um, factory and uh, it used to produce 90,000 uh, tons, uh, tons every year. And we said, okay, 100% capacity utilization, it has to be, that is the target. But during the course of the year, there was, uh, the government decided that no, the gas which is being provided to, to the, um, uh, uh, to Park China should be used uh, somewhere else, uh, maybe for the domestic purpose in somewhere in Pindi or Islamabad. And so instead of uh, the gas for 90,000 uh, tons, uh, the gas was provided only for let's say 70,000 tons. Now that assumption, that change, that assumption was changed and it must be taken for granted. If we do not take it for granted, and the, but then otherwise at the end of the day, we, will, we would, would have said that no, you did not produce 90,000, you produced let's say 70,000. So the result is that your performance has not been as good, but you have to take all those elements into consideration. And because it was taken into consideration, not once, not once, not a single uh, chief executive ever challenged the evaluation which was done by the expert advisor. And this was one of the things. I would also like to point out that when we were setting up the target um, at the beginning of the year, we never set up the target just for one, one target. We set up for 
for five various uh, level of performance, which means at the at A grade unit will get three bonus, B grade unit will get two months bonus, C one month, D 15 days, E nothing. The result was that not only the, the, the performance was being evaluated, it was being evaluated without any, any challenge ever, not that I experienced. And also that that had created some kind of a competition among the various, various units. Simply gaining the, the a certain grade itself was a matter of honor for, 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 the, for the chief executive. It was, of course, the, the pecuniary benefit which you get in terms of three bonus or two months, that or so, it matters a lot. Uh, the, for, but, but for the chief executive to get the bonus uh, of three months and A grade was a matter of, you know, an honor. And we are, to, we are, we are talking to one of the chief executive who always got A grade and he is in the present company today. So, so this is, this is the, the, another element which, uh, which uh, uh, was um, uh, taken into account. The last thing I would talk about, we kept looking into, into the, the problems and the issues with our management, which, with, with our uh, work which we were doing. In the system I'm just talking about, we had to identify ourselves that there is one problem. This system is evaluating performance on the annual basis. When it is evaluating the annual basis, the managing director or the manager is always looking at the horizon is only one year. It had to be expanded because if he does not, if it does not, not, of course, we are not talking about one of the finest chief executives who is sitting here, but we are talking about some of the, some of the, uh, the chief executives, let's say in fertilizer or uh, in other uh, um, uh, uh, cement uh, unit where the, there was, a, there was some kind of, uh, you know, uh, a not, uh, you know, incentive to produce and make profit for the year, not necessarily caring what is it going to be like three years from now or four years from now. So we had to think, we, so what we were doing was that we were evaluating the uh, enterprise or encouraging the enterprise to be a good performer, but only for one year. So to address that issue, we thought of setting of a corporate planning system. We adopted this, this, uh, uh, this um, uh, system uh, by taking uh, it from Arthur D. Little. And the result was that uh, we uh, got uh, the Arthur D. Little model and uh, who uh, helped us in developing corporate plans for five years. So those five years, so every manager, the system and the, 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 the model was such that that plan, we were only leading them to develop that plan. The plan itself was actually owned by the managers themselves. It was them who were feeding us and it is based on their information, it is based on their information that we developed those corporate plans, which became the basis of the budget, the annual budget for the enterprise, and which later on also became the basis for the, uh, for the target setting of the expert advice itself. So in turn, the, what we were uh, saying is that now the manager was not only looking at what he is going to do during the course of the year, but he was also looking at what he is, he is going to do for the coming years 
in the in future and in our system we we modified the system in such a way that we can we should not only give them the credit not only of maximizing the profit but also how much did he spent on the r and d the research how did he how much did he did the thing in terms of uh, of uh, the, a plan for uh, for the for learning what is happening in other countries of the world and the new technology and they adopt and they prepared a plan to adopt uh, those technologies and so so that means the the there was a there was a, there was the uh, the program which we had had developed to first of all to improve performance which improved for during the course of the year in a static situation but we also took care of the issues in the dynamic situation so this is in general i can tell you that what we did for the uh, in the expert advice cell in those 10 15 years the results of the efforts made by the professionals in the expert advice cell gave result within 3 to 4 years and i can tell you that uh, this is this has been in said not only by me not only by the managers of the uh, expert advice cell but uh, number of uh, the professionals in the world bank and in the other multilateral agencies they took it as, as a as a case study and they evaluated it and i can tell you that um, mary shelley in her uh, report on um, uh, the report i think it was called uh, um, performance evaluation of state enterprises in pakistan in that she uh, worked out that uh, in 3 years time the profit of the 39 enterprises which were covered under uh, the signaling system or the system which was uh, uh, developed under the in the expert advice cell doubled the profit which was uh, uh, the, which it was at the time of the beginning of the whole process and the result was that uh, not only that uh, expert advice cell was generally became fairly acceptable and then also i must say a, a favorite of certain uh, government agencies uh, and the government uh, other ministries um, that uh, the uh, our scope in the beginning was only for uh, setting up target and monitoring and evaluating only to the manufacturing sector but one day i got a call from mr basin jafri uh, from the ministry of finance and and he said mary it is time that you expand the horizon of the expert advice cell l from manufacturing to non manufacturing and we were uh, asked to evaluate and bring the um, the other non manufacturing enterprises also into uh, the purview of expert advice cell and some of the the enterprises of them were we were talking about railway nha and others uh, unfortunately this uh, was initially the the work was done for two years but uh, by the time um, this thing uh, uh, was uh, start it was prepared was ready to go into operation then the process of privatization started and then this thing went into uh, into some kind of background so this is what i wanted to uh, give um, uh, the team uh, that uh, there are also certain success stories unfortunately um, what happened was is something i must add uh, that is that uh, the expert advice cell which was taken as a model by number of countries um, i can mention two or three where i myself went and um, uh, established the, the system that was in mexico and philippines uh, mm. and by the way next door next door um, uh, uh, I, um, it was adopted 
except that we never called it uh, uh, this. We used to call uh, the system, the signaling system. They call it MOU system, but it was, and at the time of um, launching uh, these systems in the, um, uh, over there, uh, I was personally invited to help them in setting up some of the, some of the problems and some of the issues which they had faced. So this was uh, my my small little uh, contribution to to introduce uh, what we had done in the past, uh, uh, and uh, I would suggest that uh, what Aisha Zaman has uh, just talked about uh, uh, that uh, there should be we should um, uh, set up uh, some kind of uh, a, a network or some kind of institutional arrangement whereby not only the experience of uh, of uh, of uh, the of pakistan but of the other countries may also be taken up and um, and then uh, we because we have had a fairly good experience uh, as i mentioned that we had the experience of good performance uh, relative reasonably good performance in uh, 50s and 60s a fairly good performance in um, in 70s, 80s, and 90s, and obviously now we are in a difficult situation, and it's a very ironical situation that we, the country which was a model uh, at one time, I can tell you without missing my words, the, the, the country which was taken as a model in in number of countries is uh, to to address the issues and improve the performance of their corporate bodies is today we need some kind of assistance uh, uh, for uh, to address the losses of our public sector enterprises so with that i would like to thank you for uh, thank you thank you janab uh, sir thank you very much very kind of you ab main panel ke paas thodi der ke liye wapas jata hu we are about to end but nevertheless let me take up a few questions salim bazar sahab zara bataiye ki you were in city bank for a long time and city bank was in pakistan i think now it's kind of left although it's still there but uh, mcdonald bhi pakistan mein hai aur bahut sare enterprises pakistan mein hai what i find surprising is ke koi banda headquarters se aata nahi inko manage karne ke liye mera khayal maine kabhi nahi suna ke headquarters se koi aata yes shaukat ji jata tha but he came for a different reason i don't think he came to manage city bank he came for other reasons but nevertheless i don't see any real john reed kabhi nahi aaya wo थोड़ी सी how can we have decentralized management which the world seem to follow and grow very well because all these uh, multinationals are in every country in the world and growing very rapidly in every country in the world google ko le le facebook ko le le wagaira wagaira whatever so please salim raza sir what is your take on this why can't we establish a management system is it the old boys club or is it something else um <coughs> uh you know you have to have the courage to delegate at in in these type of organizations that you're talking about you built your own goals as a country you got them signed off at the highest level necessary now you were delegated all the expense it might have been you know a few 100 million dollars it might have been a few tens of millions of dollars and you were delegated all the uh, uh, signing power you know all the credit lending power that you needed to achieve those goals mm -hmm. now sometimes you broke your neck and there'd be accidents mm -hmm. by and large mm -hmm. you took this as uh, you treated this delegation as a sense of ownership mm -hmm. and you worked as if you were working for your own company mm -hmm. uh, and and but but then the institution has to have mm -hmm. has to have belief that they have trained you well that they promoted you rightly that your promotion was based on merit that you that you you are the best guy for the job 
that you've been given the experience, not only in that country, you've had a chance to work in other countries, uh, and you've had a chance to work in other disciplines within the, within the, within the organization. Now, this, this is a leap of faith based on training and based on, uh, on, on evaluation merit. It, uh, you know, that's really what you need. Are we prepared to look at our public sector heads in the same way? You know, they'll need, they'll need a, a lot. You know, I don't know what they'll need to convince you know, a ministry or whatever format they function under. I don't know how, what they'll need to do to convince them to let them spend more, to let them sign bigger deals, bigger transactions. To you know, will they be able to persuade uh, you know their their uh, up the lines that they need to merge with another company, that they need to acquire another company? Now, if you don't have the freedom to do that, if you don't have the courage to do that, because <clears throat> it's because that whole initiative is not meant to be part of your ambit, you know, then, then you're not going to get. Uh, what you described, which is little satellites functioning on their own, which is what you need. So, Sneem Sahib, you tell me, what is the reason I notice, and I think all of us notice, that most of the public sector enterprise CEOs are sitting in Islamabad almost every week for two or three days with ministries, with the, uh, meetings with the ministries. When do they do their work? I often ask them, yeah, doesn't this interfere Actually, with the Yes, uh, but, but yeah, ki, ki, I think you know this is uh, the worst time to be talking about managing public sector because we've reached a stage in the governance level where uh, managing anything in the at the state has become difficult, and that is primarily because uh, there is so much fear of accountability, financial accountability of NAB. Uh, that nobody in his right senses is willing to take any decision, especially which requires financial uh, decision making, financial outlays, some this, you know, and public sector enterprises, uh, by their definition, especially the commercial ones, even the non commercial ones, require financial decision making. Uh, if you have to take a decision, every time to the ECC and the ECC then has to take it to the cabinet. Uh, this is, unfortunately, we have regressed rather than progressed. You know, what uh, Mehdi was uh, describing was a detailed system, how the 75 industries were managed at the ministry level. And there was no interference from anybody. The Ministry of Finance came in only through its additional sector, secretary, joint sector, secretary, who was at the board of directors. Uh, so therefore, I we are at a very wrong time in trying to do anything in the public sector or trying to improve the public sector because uh, even entities which are the uh, essential entities like education and health are suffering. I mean, you know, I can tell you about two months back, a, a provincial health secretary told me that, you know, there was a file for the procurement of some equipment for a hospital, let's say for about I don't know, 30 crores or 40 crores. And the, the secretaries were preferring to get transferred or wait for their turn to get transferred out rather than sign on that 30, 40 crore rupees project because they were quite sure that they would be called by NAB, if not now, maybe six months, a year later. And so therefore, you know, that unfortunately uh, is a price we are paying uh, unintentionally for having gone into this anti-corruption thing and mm -hmm. making that as our first priority, that we have actually lost money like this broadsheet case. You know, we've actually, mm -hmm. you know, rather than recovering money, we've lost money on the balance sheet. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the worst uh, result has been that we have uh, brought the government to a, to, a, to a standstill. So therefore, the chief executive sitting in Islamabad mm -hmm. and those ministry officials with whom they are sitting are sitting with the ECC members and the ministers, uh, and the ministers are sitting in the ECC. Everybody is passing the buck up. And, uh, I, you know, unless the, the system finds a solution to this, uh, unless it instills back the confidence uh, in the decision makers, the decision that we used to make as a deputy secretary or as a deputy commissioner, 
as a deputy commissioner, those decisions are being made at the chief secretary or maybe even the chief minister level. And, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a deputy secretary, are uh, probably being made at the minister level. That is the deterioration that we have come to. So I think we are talking of a much bigger issue than just uh, following proper managerial man methods and, you know, following, uh, you know, incorporating a board of management or incorporating a, a Sarmaya company and a holding company. Uh, to me, those are just marginal things, uh, these, uh, you know, for the present. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sikandar, uh, may I just come in? May I just come in? I would like to add to what the team has just said, if you don't mind. Is it all right? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. You see, I, I don't think they, we ever went to the ministries and the government for uh, three days in a week and sat there and talked to them. We took our own decisions. We decided what you had to do and we had to face the consequences. Okay. And I think that is what management is all about. We don't have to go and ask the government if we are in the public sector as what to do. And that is what is happening. If we don't stop doing that, take your decisions and face the consequences yourself. So you don't have to rely on bureaucrats or anybody else for all that. So that's my, my answer to your question. Very good. Uh, Sikhandar sahab, I was coming to you anyways. Many you grew from 15,000 in 1991 to 40,000 today. And uh, when I do the calculation, it comes out to 3% annual growth. Now, is that uh, comfortable? Uh, do you, or should you have grown faster? I mean, it's Doran May. I mean, for example, Tesla has gone to a trillion dollar company, which is a, al almost in your area. And uh, there are other companies that have gone, I mean, even uh, agriculture, uh, some company that's related, Caterpillar, for example, which is kind of related to you has gone, grown by huge amounts. So why is it that your growth rate has been so low? I don't think that figure is correct. Achha. When, we, when we, were, we were privatized, when we were in the public sector, mm -hmm. uh, from that day to today, we have gone many folds. We have gone from, uh, I, don't, I can't remember what it was, uh, public sector at that time. But today, we are paid up capital is almost 5 billion rupees which was not there the case in, at that time. Mm -hmm. And the profits have gone up many fold. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was maybe two, three, one or two billion at that time in the public sector. It has gone up to five billion now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've gone up many times. Mm -hmm. The uh, volumes of uh, sales has gone up from uh, maybe 15,000 a year, has go, had went up to 40,000. It comes down, it goes up and goes back to 40,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a major difference between uh, private sector to public sector and again to private sector. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the, 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 company, the company has made tremendous progress during this time. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't quote the figures right now. I don't have them in front of me. So I don't want to do that. But the point is that you know, the paid up capital at the time of uh, being nationalized was 2.5 million. Mm -hmm. Today it's almost 5 billion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is, there is no comparison between then and now. So, you know, we, as a company, yeah. we've done all right. We've done well. And, and Volume also, wise, from, from 10, uh, for 10,000, it has gone up to 40,000. Yeah. And the most important thing is that we have indigenized, we've localized, we have set up a lot of ancillary industry, which is now really the backbone of the uh, automotive sector. We have 350 vending units supplying parts to us, and they are making billions of rupees in this. So I think that in itself is a great contribution. Great. We should do a study on this. And also, Nadeem, on, Nadeem on, this, on this particular thing, just, just to add to what uh, Sikandar is saying, that uh, all auto industry in this country, auto manufacturing, is basically limited by the local demand. Uh, they are not into a position for, uh, they have not really a level for exports. Miller tractors could export, but I think uh, probably uh, Sikandar would uh, correct me, but they had an issue with the with their French holders, you know, uh, that they were not allowed to export. Otherwise, the only way they could expand from 15,000 to 150,000, 200,000 was the, the local demand. They're meeting, them and Fiat are meeting, I think, 90% of the local demand in the country in any case. So the export is only possible if uh, either they're not impeded by uh, the... Uh, the um, to sort of franchise uh, holder or the franchiser, or they uh, and uh, you know they have the right kind of 
approach and the right kind of market to really capture the international market. You see, I, to come in again, we have exported almost 2,000 tractors this year up till now, and we hope to export another 1,000 tractors by the end of the year. And our principals have allowed us to do that in Africa. We have selected markets to do that. Of course, it's not completely open for us, but we are now in the phase where we have finished the indigenization process, we are now going into the export process. And I think we are going to do that in this year and in the next year. And I, if the theme is very right. We are now pushing in that direction because that is what is required. Thank you. Archad Daman sahab, I can't let you get away with just pinning down neoliberalism. I want to ask you a small thing. I know you know I'm sure you know that fundamental proposition economics myth it really doesn't matter whether it's a command economy or a, a neoliberal economy as just a free market economy provided you run things properly right and uh, based on price signals or whatever now the question is we have realized that our management system is deformed hai the steam sahab bhi agree karte hain apna salim raza sahab bhi agree karte hain sab agree karte hain hamara management system is not deformed hai ki hum to kuch rani nahi kar sakte to aap mujhe bataiye ki in this Milieu, am I okay in recommending a neoliberal, neoliberal solution and saying, hey, yaar, forget the government, they are, they are the pain? Because this is what we are doing in the PID. So I'd like your wisdom on that. I don't know if I have much wisdom to offer, but let me make a, a few points. Yeah. First of all, uh, the neoliberal system, tha, mm. wo, uh, unfortunately, jo, इंग्लैंड से आईएमएफ जो पहुंचा तो वो बहुत डाइल्यूट हो गया था बेसिकली न्यूलिबरल्स एज्यूम्ड कि इंग्लिश कॉमन लॉ ट्रेडिशन जो सेंचुरीज से मौजूद था वो इंडिविजुअल राइट्स को सेफ गार्ड करता था एंड देयर केस वाज दैट गवर्नमेंट एक्सपेंशन इंपीड्स ऑन द राइट ऑफ द एवरेज इंग्लिशमैन टू मेक अ प्रॉफिट इन एंटरप्राइज the and this will come to the next point also hamare yahan problem ye hai ke we never look at our own problems we are perennially looking at singapore or timbuktu for a model to imitate and wo model isliye nahi carry over karta hai ki wo jo infrastructure of governance hai laws legislature a responsible executive an independent judiciary none of that exists and that is what affects management as well kyunki jab aapke property rights nahi established hai to baki rights ka aap kya kahenge then i remember early in when i came here so in the ministry of finance the feeling was ki i came from uh, the world bank i thought ki bhai external reserves badhni chahiye it's very interesting in america and england the organization that is called treasury hamare is called finance because in in sovereign countries you seek to collect treasure yeah in colonial countries you do not want the intermediary who is siphoning revenues mm. towards the center to have any reserves hamare so, the job of the ministry of finance is to borrow Now, in this situation, वो मैनेजमेंट जो है वो हो नहीं सकती है जैसा कि तस्नीम ने कहा कि आपका द लॉ सिस्टम इज अ वेपन इन देंड्स ऑफ द पावरफुल कोई जस्टिस वस्टिस नहीं है कोई यू कैंट रिलाई ऑन द सुप्रीम कोर्ट टू लुक आफ्टर यू आई दर सो दैट बेसिक सोशल एंड पोलिटिकल फाउंडेशन इज नॉट देयर एंड दैट नीड्स टू बी टेकन केयर ऑफ बिफोर यू ट्रांसफर प्लांट न्यू लिबर मैनेजमेंट question that you raised earlier i take a slightly different view from what salim and tasneem and, and the others have taken mm. i don't know whether i'm right or wrong i'm intimidated by mm. the number of years i think there are two centuries of experience here mm. <laughs> between the four experts gathered here mm. but in my way of thinking i make a distinction between leadership mm. management and administration towards unified goals hamare yahan unified goals hi nahi hai abhi bhi ye jhagda hai ki islam chale gaye ya modernity 
मैनेजमेंट में मैनेजर्स मैनेज प्रोसेसिस एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर मैनेज टास्क ट्रेजडी ऑफ पाकिस्तान इज लीडर्स तो खत्म हो गए लियाकत अली खान की फैसिनेशन के बाद फिर एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर्स टू कोवर मैनेजमेंट और अब ये टास्क यानी दिस पेंटोमाइन एंड द फुट हिल्स ऑफ मारगला विच वी आर सपोज टू रिगार्ड एज गवर्नमेंट इज नॉट गवर्नमेंट एट ऑल यानी क्या हम हम जब बिना इमेजिन के है the equivalent of Queen Elizabeth is Dr. Alvi. And you go down the line, so so what? What is this mazak? This total pantomime. <laughs> so the problems of enterprise management come from the larger context of the system of laws and governance, infrastructure of governance. Can you imagine? So you can assume that in America or in England, on the basis of this, you can make the best practices. But to move from the negative to the positive, I think this problem is very important. But to move from the negative to the positive, I think. but to move from the negative to the positive i think what we need is a very realistic appraisal ye jo tamasha hai gala ki pahadiyon ke niche isko ye hamari hai bewakoofi hogi agar hum ise hukumat samjhe ye kar rahi hai mr out ho gaya government at all ye kuch log hain jo masks pehen ke ek dusre ki nakle utar rahe hain and therefore inse kehna ki aap independent action le आप ये कर दें आप वो कर दें रिस्पॉन्सिबल हो आप किंग्स पर्स को पब्लिक पर्स से सेपरेट करें विच इज दी लॉजिक बिहाइंड दी द टू पार्ट्स ऑफ द बजट हमने अंग्रेजों से ये लिख लिया है दैट डजेंट वर्क सो नाउ व्हाट डू वी नीड टू डू वी नीड टू रियलाइज टू डाइग्रेस अयूब खान के जमाने में जब भुट्टो साहब अपनी मूवमेंट चला रहे थे इन द लास्ट डेज तो सरदार बहादुर खान जो उनके छोटे भाई थे वो लीडर ऑफ द ऑपोजिशन थे तो मुल्क की हालात पे उन्होंने तबसरा किया था जो जो शेर मुझे बार बार आजकल आज याद कल याद है वो शेर ये था पुराना शेर था कि हर बर्बाद गुलिस्ता करने को बस एक ही उल्लू काफी था हर शाख पे उल्लू बैठा है अंजाम गुलिस्ता क्या होगा तो हमें वी हैव टू रियलाइज दैट दिस pantomime that we call government will not deliver the question is ke hum panch aadmi yahan baith ke kya kar sakte hain and this is why in my presentation i concluded by saying ke forget about giving uh, policy advice to a government that is uh, paralyzed yani it's in policy catatonia you can't ask a catatonic person ke bhai utho khade ho jao aur multi utha lo why give him that even though it may be the more sensible thing i suspect that the that the time is certainly running out the ship is sinking and if we are to make it in time perhaps a group of experienced people like sekandar and tasneem and led by istiqbal who is probably the world's greatest living authority on public enterprises in pakistan could mm-hmm. take up a small problem ye koi bade masle nahi hum solve kar sakte hain mm-hmm. but if we take up a small problem of state enterprise and under this one man storm that is nadi mulhaq kyunki yahan ke tahal ka maza diya hai agar aap dono hazrat sharik ho jaye aur aaj do teen char panch proposals bahut mufid aaye hain inko leke aap aage badhe jis yani hasbe istitaat jo hamari istitaat hai salim ne kaha ke dfcs ko revive karna chahiye let us see how this can be marketed um tasneem bata rahe the ki bhai bureaucracy mein mein kya masail hai to khair hamara rajda wahan baitha hua hai ishrat husain se kahiye ki kuch kare iske bare mein but i mean let us pick up small things to see if we can build on log ground but firm तो मेरे मेरी नाचीज राय में तो यही कुछ किया जा सकता है अब बाकी वेदर द वाटर राइजेस अबव आवर हेड्स बिफोर वी गेट एनीवेयर ठीक ठीक अच्छा सलीम साहब लेट मी टर्न टू यू वेरी क्विकली कि ये डीएफसीस का जो आपका प्रपोजल है आई मीन एम आई नॉट राइट दैट डीएफसीस फेल्ड इन पाकिस्तान एम आई नॉट राइट दैट दे वर वर्चुअली ऑल इनसॉल्वेंट 
and that they had been taken for a ride by the rent seekers. Are we, is it, are we capable of setting up good DFCs in this management system where nothing can be delegated, no. nothing can be handled? And second, no. iska second part, we may have to why is why do people not make more use of the stock market? Why is debt market so uh, important? After all, in regular finance, debt and finance are the same. So why don't people get more uh, stock? Uh, sorry, equity finance rather than just debt finance. Acha, to to answer the first question, hmm. Wikic was an institution while it worked till the early seventies. So was IDBP. Hmm. On the board were donors' representatives. So the World Bank was on the board. As it so happens, Bank of America was an investor. A Bank of America was on the board. Mm -hmm. And it worked institutionally. It promoted from within. Yes, the head of PKQ was very often a civil servant, but the experts were all people chosen for skills other than finance because they were meant to advise industry on what to do, on what to choose, and on how to put things together. Mm -hmm. While it was left alone to work as an institution, it worked brilliantly, I think. I think IDBP worked very well. I think even NDFC, which came up later in the early years, was very effective. I think bankers' equity, you ask some of the businessmen here, they'll tell you that bankers' equity got them going. It was putting in private equity, it was putting in venture capital. Then, in the 80s, the entire financial sector collapsed after the, after the nationalized banks became extensions of government policy. And, and, and that's... And that, and that is really, you see, we shouldn't confuse the earlier public institutions with the later public. When we think of, and, and, uh, when you think of nationalization here, we think of the industries Mr. Bhutto nationalized, which all made a very sorry end. So we think of public sector institutions in that context. But I would say what we built up before mm -hmm. that, which were run institutionally, were very powerful. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we've heard a lot of skepticism about we'll ever fit, you know, we we'll ever work our way out of this paper bag, but, uh, you know, one can, you know, remain convinced as I am that we can repeat what we did in the past. It's the same people. But if we can run companies abroad, run businesses abroad, we, we, we can certainly do it here. Mm -hmm. uh, the second on, on uh, uh, stock market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stock market will list on up uh, for, uh, as, as a public limited company. Board disclosure hota hai. Mm -hmm. comments hota hai. Bahut my company ke analysis hota hai. Uh, if you go to the public markets, you are you have to be committed to balance sheet based formal growth with a lot of disclosure, a lot of you know public shareholders asking questions. <clears throat> and our businessmen, by and large, don't prefer you know, prefer not to get entangled with uh, with that mess. Mm -hmm. We raise, uh, if you look at the uh, the financing of our corporations, less than 1% comes from the stock market. Mm -hmm. The rest is internally generated finance or debt. Mm -hmm. And this hasn't changed. So our stock market is a trading platform. It's not a capital raising platform. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the fact. Mm -hmm. Now it's held together by very powerful people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so it gets a lot. Now, now you tell me why. why, why but just tell me why the stock market is in the newspapers every day. Chabi, 52 ho gai, 33 ho gai, 44 taliyam, 44 ho gai. What difference is it making to anyone except to investors? Is it doing anything for growth? Is it doing anything for employment? Mm. So, but why does it get so much publicity? Mm. 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 So, Salim, if you have so, finished, then, then I'd like to, to, to jump in. And, and, and my second comment on this, our cotton crop is down from whatever it was at its peak, 12, 13 to 6. And then I'm telling you that the textile industry is $3 billion of machinery. It's a very good finance bill and it's a very good chance. And like we've heard several times before, our exports are now going to grow at 25%. But you have gas in the same way. And you have to buy gas from where we want to buy gas from where we want to buy gas. And by God, watch us perform. You, you help, we perform. And the 6 million bales of cotton is the same as our crop. The one who imports will have to do it. How much mention do you see? And why are we in this position? You know, I was talking about Imbrapa. You know, are these things we couldn't help for ourselves? The sugar is going to go, a lot of cotton, a lot of maize is going to go, because the prices aren't good enough. Why aren't the prices good enough? Because our mill owner can import when he wants to. He is not compelled, nobody is compelled back to improving the quality. Nobody is uh, compelled back to improving the quality of our cotton to get the farmer going back again. Mm 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13 million bills. But you won't see mention of this in the newspaper. Mm. So I think the way our economy is presented mm. is really tilted to <clears throat> either the export industry or the LSM, which together is about 17% of GDP. Mm. Uh, you know, the bulk of the remaining doesn't get a mention. There are real issues, there are real solutions, there, there's a lot that can be done. Mm. Um, but there we are. Mm. Okay. Ashutab? I might... Uh... Stock market, I endorse 100% what Salina said. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a story. In 82, when I came back from Washington, so I was my minister, Ulam Isa Khan, and I was like, sir, I was like, 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 I was And it hasn't changed much since then. But the more important point was your first point. And I would mention any two points that Salim made that I want to endorse. First point is, okay, look, we are back in the 50s. We are back in a position where you have a private sector that is skittish, does not want to invest. And so there is a need now to redo PIDC and, and PICIC. And, and I, I would put NDFC, the late NDFC, as a much more appropriate institution in the context of our discussion of SOEs, because SOE financing and DFC is mm -hmm. And successful institutions were ka model hamare hamesha sort of jo civil servant zere atab aya hai na, mm -hmm. usne financial institutions bade achche chalaye. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he has the contacts and you, you, do, you cannot run financial institutions in Pakistan mm -hmm. without having the contacts mm -hmm. and having the service strength mm -hmm. to resist pressure. Aftab Ahmed Khan sahab suraya karte the when he was in NDFC, raat ko anti-corruption committee appoint hui, subha ko chairman aagya ke ji mera loan phasa hua hai aapke. So you need that combination. But it is a complete falsehood to say the DFCs were a failure in Pakistan. Fashions shifted in Washington, but DFCs were a great success. And so they ought to be revived. That's all. I'm going to hold you to this. I hope you would give us a paper. You and Salim would give us a paper on uh, for PID. Paper to which we should publish because I'm still a skeptic on DFCs. But we'll take that up again. Can I, can I interrupt? G, G, please go ahead. Hmm. हैंडल किया गया है वो भी तो आप देखें कि दो मिसाले मैं आपको देता हूं एक तो है एनडीएफसी जिसकी अभी बात किया है और एक दूसरा है आईडीबीपी जिसकी अभी बात हुई है आईडीबीपी व्हिच वाज नॉट डूइंग एनीथिंग एंड एनडीएफसी व्हिच वाज डूइंग एवरीथिंग मे बी नॉट नॉट एवरीथिंग राइट बट वाज डूइंग एवरीथिंग एनडीएफसी वाज वाइंडेड अप आईडीबीपी इज स्टिल देयर what logic, what rationale do we have? The, another one, which you don't hear much about, well, obviously not many people remember it, it anymore, ICP. Hmm. So, the more stock market has developed, as it has ICP was a big major role. But what happened? What way? प्रॉब्लम जो है वो प्रॉब्लम क्या है मैं आपको बताऊं जब मैं एनआईटी को लुक आफ्टर कर रहा था तो मुझे जनाब एनआईटी तो अभी तक बैठी हुई है आई नो बैठी हुई है बिल्कुल करती क्या एनआईटी मुझे बता दे वो वो इन्वेस्ट कर रही है वो पैसे बना रही है क्या बताऊं इन्वेस्ट कर इन्वेस्टमेंट तो उनकी 30 साल पुरानी है कोई नई इन्वेस्टमेंट तो नहीं करते पुरानी इन्वेस्टमेंट बैठे हुए हां दैट दैट इज राइट मैं मैं एनआईटी के सपोर्ट में बात मैं नहीं कह कह रहा मैं बताने की ये कोशिश कर रहा हूं कि जो एनआईटी बिल्कुल व्हाट यू आर सेइंग कि एनआईटी जिस जो के वही कर रहा है जो आज से 10 साल पहले या 20 साल पहले कर रहा था मगर आईसीपी जो के बहुत कुछ कर रहा था जितने भी आ, जो कितने कम कम 25 उन्होंने खोले थे जो सेंटर्स वो दे हैव ऑल बीन क्लोज डाउन 
the ICP is not there anymore. Hmm. NIT is still there. So you see the problem jo hui hai, wo ye hui hai ke hum jo hai ek cheez ko nahi realize kar rahe ke har cheez jo hai ek loves hai privatization. Privatization, I'm, I'm not a, a great opponent of privatization. There is nothing wrong. The problem is that every institution in the public sector has to be a good job or a bad job. They are on the list of privatization. When they are on the list of privatization, they, we have not thought of it that जो उसके मैनेजमेंट है वो काम करना बंद कर देती है डिसीजन लेना बंद कर देती है मैं आपको बता रहा हूं एक मिसाल हमारी एक बहुत अच्छी जो फर्टिलाइजर की यूनिट थी उसका नाम था पाक सऊदी फर्टिलाइजर वन ऑफ द मनी स्पिनर वन ऑफ द फनी स्पिनर और इन 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 द होल ऑफ फर्टिलाइजर इंडस्ट्री उसका मैनेजर जो है मुझे हर साल जब टारगेट सेटअप करने के लिए हम बैठते थे तो हर साल आम के मुझसे कहता था मैरी साहब खुदा हाफिज अगले साल तो आपसे मुलाकात नहीं होगी मैंने कहा क्यों होगा अगले साल तक तो हम प्राइवेटाइज हो जाएंगे उस दरमियान में उसको ये इंस्ट्रक्शंस आ गई थी कि जी आपने कोई रिसर्च नहीं करनी कोई बीएमआर नहीं करना कोई बैलेंसिंग नहीं करनी आपने क्योंकि आप प्राइवेटाइज होने वाले हैं और उसका डिसाइड करने के कौन करेगा कौन नहीं करेगा वो प्राइवेटाइजेशन कमीशन था तो कहने का मतलब ये है कि ऑल दी थिंग्स व्हिच वी टेक डिसीजन उसका जो इंपैक्ट्स हैं वो हम नहीं देखते हैं और दिस इज वन ऑफ द रीजंस कि हमारी इस वक्त जो है बहुत सारे प्राइवेट सेक्टर जो पब्लिक सेक्टर एंटरप्राइज हु आर डूइंग क्वाइट वेल एट वन टाइम अब दे आर वेयर दे आर नाउ थैंक यू तस्नीम साहब आपसे जरा क्विकली एक चीज पूछ लें कि ये जो कह रहे हैं कि एनआईटी अभी तक चल रही है एनआईटी के पास मेरा ख्याल उन्होंने कोई शेयर नहीं खरीदा 1980 के बाद उनके पास तो सारे पुराने शेयर्स पड़े हैं वो सिर्फ डिविडेंड्स में चली जा रहे हैं चली जा रहे हैं कोई मतलब नहीं मुझे समझ आ रहा उनके एग्जिस्टेंस का नंबर 2 देखिए अगर प्राइवेटाइजेशन की बात करते हैं प्राइवेटाइज होता तो कुछ नहीं है सिर्फ बातें होती हैं एंड वी कीप टॉकिंग अबाउट سرمایہ एंड ऑल दिस कुछ नहीं होता दूसरी चीज तस्नीम साहब एक और बड़ी इंपॉर्टेंट चीज है ये आईएमएफ प्रोग्राम व्हाट एवर इट माइट से मैं आईएमएफ के साथ बात रेगुलरली करता हूं मैं उनको भी दान तने देता हूं कि तुम क्या कर रहे हो भाई साले ये हमारे आधे रेवेन्यू से जो हमारी लीकेजेस ना ऑलमोस्ट हाफ ऑफ रेवेन्यूस आई मेक अ केस पब्लिक सेक्टर एंटरप्राइजेस जो उनसे हैं अपने का सर्कुलर डेट इज अबाउट 1.2 व्हिच इज ह्यूज ठीक है जी वी हैव लॉस्ट अबाउट 10 ट्रिलियन अकॉर्डिंग टू आवर कैलकुलेशन 10 ट्रिलियन रुपीस इन पब्लिक सेक्टर सॉरी इन सिर्फ एनर्जी लॉसेस ऑन द लास्ट in the last 10 years we lose about 500 billion a year we lose about 3 400 in commodity finance we lose pi ke aapne dekh liye figures railway ke wagaira we are losing roughly about 1.5 trillion rupees on the pscs we are also losing ab jo humne baat hi nahi ki jis pe hum baat karenge at some stage aap logo ko phir leke aayenge ki hum pstp mein agar dekhein neelam jhelum ko dekh le islamabad airport ko dekh le pstp bhi mare bahut takre losses hain jo koi calculate hi nahi karta so i would think that the public sector loses roughly half of revenues every year more than the army by the way through these losses and nobody talks about them right now we are losing a huge amount of money more than our defense budget and everybody wants to cut the defense budget but nobody wants to cut the def- the losses of the of the public sector phir ye bhi baat hui management ki ke janab maine dekha for example badi dafa baat hoti hai even shakil durani usko bhi bulana chahiye tha bhul hi gaye शकील दुरानी एडमिट्स के लिए सारा वक्त वो बैठा होता था मिनिस्ट्री में ठीक है द मिनिस्ट्री रियली वांट्स टू रन दीज एंटरप्राइजेस दैट्स अ फैक्ट हमने एनर्जी बुक को पांच छह वेबिनार्स कराए हैं विद अबाउट 50 डिफरेंट पीपल एंड एवरीवन सेज दैट द फॉल्ट इज द सेक्रेटरीज आई विल बी मोर स्पेसिफिक दैट द सेक्रेटरी लाइक्स टू रन द सिस्टम कैन दिस बी डन शुड दिस बी डन आप बताइए यू माशाल्लाह वन ऑफ द फेमस सेक्रेटरीज व्हाट डू यू रिकमेंड एज अ गवर्नेंस चेंज देखिए गवर्नेंस का जो है ना उसका यू नो द द प्रॉब्लम इज दैट वी हैड लोकल गवर्नेंस व्हिच वाज यू नो सो कॉल्ड कॉलोनियल बट द द फायदा वाज दैट इन द इरा दैट वी वर देयर द डिस्ट्रिक्ट गवर्नेंस और द डिस्ट्रिक्ट इफेक्टिवनेस वाज एब्सोल्यूट यू नो 
uh, you could uh, but unfortunately uh isi chakkar mein ke wo since there was some bad eggs in the field as deputy commissioners and commissioners arrogant and you know non available maybe some of them were corrupt the whole system was bound up now similarly there is no system which is right or wrong in my view uh systems evolve in an organization wherever you try and reform the systems uh drastically you know you get up uh, get into a trouble and therefore up administrative reforms ki history pakistan ki dekh le ke zyada tar administrative reforms se improvement nahi aayi kharabi aayi hai jo bhi thode bahut hue hain ab present government ka dekhenge 2.5 saal se administrative reforms ki baat kar rahe hain and they are claiming a lot of administrative reform they are really basically just uh, um changing the notifications and commas and full stops mm-hmm. of the promotion policy and the commas and full stop of the rotation policies things that have been tried repeatedly mm-hmm. so therefore uh the, the in, i don't think that uh, it is the issue that some secretary is calling too many people the the problem is that the delegation of power which used to be there jis zamane mein ke the public sector enterprises were successfully run mm-hmm. like Miller tractors was one. There were scores of factories, uh, you know, making fertilizer, making cement, which were successfully being run, and there was no grouse because people were not called to the ministry. Now, who is it? What is that? The political milieu has deteriorated, and the pressure on the secretary is that he will face a, a, a blast or a bezeti in every meeting of the cabinet. so he is under pressure he passes on the pressure to the chief executives or the people under him and so jo maine pehle baat ki ki decision making has gone up you know rather than being delegated to wo sari impact karti hai aapke performance ko ke secretaries jo hain wo ya to apne performance ko samajhte hain behtar karne ke liye is kisam ka unko micro manage karne ki zarurat padti hai aur ya aise hote hain federal secretaries jo ke uh, you know they maybe stay 6 months 9 months a year and if and things can start getting hot they much rather getting uh, get transferred mm-hmm. rather than face the music so therefore jo jo aapka hai na baithe rehne ka the jo mera khayal hai tohmat hai wo it's a reflection of a individual and b the political milieu that has changed and deteriorated you know aur wo mera khayal hai ki jab tak उस तरफ कोई रिफॉर्म नहीं होगा और उसका रिफॉर्म होने का चांसेस इस वास्ते नहीं है कि अभी आप देखें कि ये हुकूमत ढाई साल से आई है बड़े गुड इंटेंशन से आई है और ये कहते हैं कि कहते हैं कि उनकी सारे जो पेपर पे स्टेटेड चीजें थी वाल देवर कंटेस्टिंग ऑल राइट बट हैविंग कम इन टू पावर दे सीम टू हैव लॉस्ट दे वे यू नो इन दिस पेंटोमाइम दैट अरशद साहब इज सेड अबाउट इस्लामाबाद they seem to have lost their way hmm. and it's unlikely to me that they are like you know that we we're going to find hmm. the way in the next 2 years because they are they are fighting for their uh, survival and not necessarily for planning something which is big and so uh, unless we sort out the macro political issues none of the things that we are talking about will either get improved और एंड लाइक लाइक अर्शद साहब सेड कि आप ये रिकमेंडेशन भेज दें आप जो भी रिकमेंडेशन यहाँ से आई है भेज दें कोई वहां पढ़ने वाला नहीं होगा यानी वो कोई आपसे डिस्कस करने वाला नहीं होगा उसको इम्प्लीमेंट करना तो बहुत बात की बात बिल्कुल सही मैं देखता रहता हूँ जी तस्म साहब यूल बी अम्यूज आई आस्क एवरी वेबिनार आदर एनी सिविल सर्वेंट शेयर एंड आंसर इज ऑलवेज नो I ask are there any politicians here the answer is always no so you're absolutely right in the corridors of power their cut is they're situated in silos where they have no ears they don't listen they don't want to talk that's besides the point chale but let me ask one last question from all of you eisenhower ki badi famous statement hai uska book hai that plans are worthless but planning is everything to salim raza sahab aap bataiye did city bank have plans did they have announced plans announced policies did they Sort of work on things that you were doing. 
policies and plans very carefully because hukumat mein i'll come back to the same rai sir and whoever likes mujhe to pehle policy nazar nahi aati hukumat mein in the last 20 years we had not analyzed almost everything that has been done has been done by the donors hamari nepra ki law donors ne banayi hamari पब्लिक फाइनेंशियल मैनेजमेंट की लॉ डोनर्स ने बनाई हमारी स्टेट बैंक की लॉ डोनर्स ने बनाई तो हमारी मिनिस्ट्री तो अब काम करना छोड़ दिया है तस्नीम साहब ठीक कहते हैं दे बट वो एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ब्यूरोक्रेसीज बट ये तस्नीम साहब बहुत पहले वे बैक जब बंती यहाँ आया था 1958 में तो वी टुक ऑन द ब्यूरोसी टुक ऑन द मेंटल ऑफ डेवलपमेंट although we should have had a separate development bureaucracy now the development bureaucracy uh, the, the bureaucracy is divided to mai kafi dafa is pe likh bhi chuka hu go back to the magisterial role magisterial role chhod diya everybody wants to develop and development se aage people want to manage public sector enterprises iske sath ek aur cheez hai dfi salim sahab exist kar rahi hain ek to pak saudi pak libya ye to badi achhi they are very good again i have analyzed them but achhi naukriya for retired bankers i mean you get them and they are great talkers i don't know what they do but they exist so where's the game they invest on the they invest largely on the stock exchange so so what's happening the dfis exist bankers get great jobs they get paid 50 lakhs a month what are they doing you know you know what the df what should happen with the dfis is through agreement with all the investing governments we should merge them cre- create one solid development bank and make it work our objectives uh, but uh, anyway that's one solution for it. पर ये मुझे बताइए ना ये जो पहली बात थी कि जी डिड यू हैव प्लान्स इन सिटी बैंक एंड पॉलिसीज एंड व्हाई डज द गवर्नमेंट नॉट हैव देम यू बीन माशाल्लाह गवर्नर सेंट्रल बैंक डू वी हैव एनी प्लान्स एंड पॉलिसीज इन द गवर्नमेंट आई थिंक बनाते हैं प्लान्स आई थिंक दे सेट असाइड एंड दे शुड बी इग्नोर्ड इन द ब्रीच आई थिंक आई थिंक वी हमारी प्लानिंग होराइजन इज वन ईयर डिसरप्टेड सेवरल टाइम्स इन द कोर्स ऑफ दैट वन so so we neither have plans nor do we have indicative plans hmm. nor do we have sort of, you know plans that look at some horizon that one way or the other will get there hmm. so i agree i mean there is a total void hmm. and that creates a void in vision and that makes all your that's why your policy making hmm. economic and commercial policy making is subordinated either to the needs of imf or to the needs of your big business hmm. without hmm. planning without planning you cannot prevent and that's where we are i would go i i i would really really go for the re- i mean i would say the number one if it can be done is to put the planning commission back in the saddle where it was once and it doesn't have to plan five five years and one year it can give you indicative planning it can coordinate the requirements it can decide on allocation of finance which today is outside the power of public sector enterprises everything is done by the finance ministry तो कुछ यू वर देयर यू नो डिड यू डिड यू सी होप इन इन द प्लानिंग कमीशन बीइंग एबल टू गेट बैक इनटू सम काइंड ऑफ गाइडेंस रोल नो नॉट एट ऑल नॉट एट ऑल अच्छा साहब बताइए हां मैं कह रहा था ये कि नदीम द गवर्नमेंट प्लान्स इन द पीपल प्लॉट एंड एंड प्लॉट्स आर यूजुअली मोर सक्सेसफुल देन प्लान्स हमारी प्लानिंग जो है ऑल प्लान डॉक्यूमेंट्स इन फोर कलर प्रिंट ऑन ग्लॉसी पेपर आर मार्केटिंग डॉक्यूमेंट्स एनीबडी हु अंडरस्टैंड्स गवर्नमेंट रियलाइजेस दैट द एक्टिविटीज ऑफ गवर्नमेंट्स आर स्ट्रेटेजिक अगर हम किसी जनरल से पूछे कि तुम लिख के मुझे दे दो कि प्लान क्या है तुम्हारा ऑफ अटैकिंग इंडिया तो एज वो जर्मन जनरल से ऑल वॉर प्लान आर useless after the first bullet is fired hmm. so jo jo tum jis policy ki tum talash mein ho hmm. wo policy exist karti hai hmm. wo exist karti hai closed meetings mein kahin likhi hui nahi hoti hai hmm. kitchen cabinet that meets before the cabinet meets hmm. jo teen char aadmiyon ki panch aadmiyon ki hoti hai jo regular feature hai hmm. yani agar 10 baje cabinet hai to 9:30 baje wo meeting hoti hai kahin hmm. uski minutes nahi hoti hai cabinet division has no knowledge of it hmm. that is where policy is made policy meaning plans to be implemented hmm. baaki hmm. hum par mutalba itna hota hai wo hmm. kehta ji world bank wale kehte hain ki hame ye plan chahiye rolling plan chahiye jumping plan chahiye slipping plan chahiye to wo hmm. humne ek routine lagayi hui hai wo plan bana ke deti rehti hai it isn't hmm. that there isn't any planning hmm. planning is the plots are there 
जो चीज तुम्हें नजर आती है कि हमारे प्लान सारे कुछ नहीं है दे आर नॉट वर्किंग साइकोलॉजिस्ट सेव फिनोमिनन कॉल्ड स्ट्रेटेजिक हेल्पलेसनेस वो ये कहते हैं कि एक न्यूक्लियर साइंटिस्ट होता है वो दफ्तर जाके बम बनाता है घर आके कहता है अपनी बीवी से कि मुझे मोजे नहीं मिल रहे तो बीवी उसे मोजे तलाश करके देती है तो इसको स्ट्रेटेजिक हेल्पलेसनेस कहते हैं तो जब डोनर हमसे कहा के कहता है कि साहब हमारी ख्वाहिश ये है कि हम जुमा के रोज नमाज के बाद आपके सेक्रेटरी को सड़क पे ले जाके दो थप्पड़ मारे तो हम कहते हैं ब्रिलियंट आइडिया लेट्स फॉर्म अ कमेटी एंड कमेटी विल कम अप विद रिपोर्ट अब वो वर्ल्ड बैंक में जाके वो अपना बैक टू ऑफिस रिपोर्ट लिखता है जनाब वो द गवर्नमेंट इज टोटली इनकॉम्पिटेंट आई वॉज सरप्राइज वेन आई केम टू गवर्नमेंट ये हाउ कॉम्पिटेंट गवर्नमेंट इज इन दिंग्स इट वॉन्ट्स टू डू मेरे पास एज इकोनॉमिक एडवाइजर एक्सपोर्ट और इम्पोर्ट की स्टेटिस्टिक्स विद इन आवर्स आ जाया करते थे अक्रॉस द कंट्री अंटिल द कंप्यूटर डिस्ट्रॉयड इट फिर वो जो पुराने लोग थे वो कहते थे सर अगर आपको फॉरन चाहिए तो मैं हाथ से करके देता हूँ कंप्यूटर से तीन दिन लगेगी तो आंसर योर क्वेश्चन इज के देर आर पॉलिसी बट इफ एनी थिंग इज पब्लिक इट इज नॉट अ पॉलिसी इट इज मार्केटिंग ओके गुड थैंक यू वेरी मच आई थिंक दिस इज बीन अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सेमिनार और बड़ी देर हो गई है अनफॉर्चुनेटली सो आई थिंक वी शुड क्लोज इट डाउन इस्तेकबाल साहब आई विल कॉल यू टू राउंड इट अप सो दैट वी कैन क्लोज इट डाउन जी माय अनम्यूट कर ले इस्तेकबाल साहब थैंक यू थैंक यू नदीम वंस अगेन एज आई सेड अर्लियर दैट इट वाज अ प्लेजर having uh, uh, the, uh, the the most uh, uh, you know uh, professionals uh, around um, and um, nadim um, all i can say is that um, which i said earlier that it was a, it was a uh, some kind of a music to my ears uh, for one reason for one reason is that um, not only that uh, public sector was not uh, condemned but there was also some 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 thoughts which were which came out about it and i i hope we we are able to do something about it and uh, as you yourself had uh, proposed that uh, we should not have one seminar or or uh, um, we should have a series of that maybe two or three uh, like that and uh, maybe we we uh, we uh, i should start uh, planning for the next few and maybe ideas uh, from the uh, from the present company and they can give some some proposals uh, what are the various areas where we should focus on on personally i my my uh, feeling is you see uh, I, i'm again i'm not being biased or anything in somehow this whole privatization and uh, talk is becoming very damaging the, re- the reason i am saying is that there are number of things which are not being done because simply because that is going to be privatized and it's a part of the and which is not going to and which is not even being privatized and that is the worst thing that uh, you are talking about it and um, the result is the other day i uh, so and i was shocked when i saw you know my last bank which i had um, uh, uh, you know heading uh, uh, that was the agriculture bank and i was told that that is uh, that has come on 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 the uh, privatization list no problem if you can privatize go ahead but you are not going to privatize it the result is that whatever it is it is what do, doing in so many days probably even that is not going to to can you imagine a bank um, uh, for the last 3 years did not have a board so so those are the things which which are which are um, uh, damaging and i think it will be useful when we have um, uh, uh, the uh, the next um, uh, two or three uh, um, subject uh, to focus on and uh, one is the various impact of um, uh, um, uh, privatization not uh, i'm not saying that we they should not be privatization but it is that it should be there should be some kind of uh, you know b- thought about it that how do we approach and minimize the damages which is being caused by 
by simply by saying something and not doing it. So, so with that, uh, Nadeem, thank you very much. I would once again uh, thank you for um, uh, or, um, encouraging the subject, and um, I hope we shall be able to um, uh, pick up um, uh, some thoughts uh, from there, and then then uh, carry on in the in the forthcoming in the webinar which we are going to have. Thank you, Mehdi sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Salim Mirza. Thank you, Tasneem Mirani. Thank you, Sikandar sir. Thank you, Arshad Dhaman sir. I will just say this, Kiji. We are very grateful to you for coming to PAID and helping us do this. Our initiative at PAID is really to establish a national narrative and a, and, and a research agenda. And uh, these webinars are directed towards the kids. We've had a day. Let's, let's try and lead them with good ideas. And uh, what I found, find in academia is we are researching, as Ashad said, on, on crazy topics. Our research agenda is national, but donor has told us what we are doing. And with the result that there is really clearly no domestic debate on any issue. For example, most of our kids don't even know what a DFI is. They don't even know what Pak Saudi is. I think we really need to educate these kids on these issues and talk to them about it. So we're trying to establish, through these webinars, we're trying to establish national research agenda. We are, we are linking these webinars to, um, to a research fund, we are, uh, which is called RASTA, Research for Social Transformation and Advancement. And that RASTA is creating a countrywide research competition. And we are trying to mainstream these webinar subjects onto the, that, that <coughs> our student community, our university community to start thinking about these things. We are right now trying to only emulate the West. We want to get them out of emulating the West. So let's see how it goes. It's an experiment. It's worth trying. I don't think uh, it can be done in a big and in very quick time. But we will do these webinars again and again. And we'll invite you again and again to give your wisdom. After all, you have, mashallah, got a huge amount of knowledge. And we will try and, abhi hamare bache jo hain, they will transcribe this webinar, not transcribe, but they'll summarize it. We've already had about 100 plus webinars. And our kids have prepared a book based on those webinars. And we, we are going to use, prepare another book this year. So your whatever you've said is going to be translated into a paper and it will be taken up by um, you know, uh, research professionals. So that's the whole purpose of these uh, webinars. We will invite you again and again. We will inshallah repeat this again. The idea is to learn. And thank you very much. Thank you for helping us. Learn. Thank you. Thank you, thank, you very much. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Good All the best. Thank you. All the best, Thank everybody. You.